2022. I believe Councilman Goods has the invocation. Good. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, we have the pleasure this morning of having Reverend Kendrick J. Gardner, to the age of 17, has been teaching and preaching the gospel, recently teaching Edison Elementary, which is in my district, with Hillsborough County School System. He's been honored with an RA Doctor of Divinity degree from St. Thomas Christian College, Jacksonville, Florida. In 2006, he was selected as Who's Who by the Heritage Registry of Clergy. He currently serves as a senior lead pastor of the New Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, which is on Lake Avenue. He's, he's a published author with three widely requested books, 21 Days of Hope, Keepers of Vision, and God's Treasury of Salvation. He is married to his lovely wife, Denise D. Gardner. This morning I give you Reverend Kendrick J. Gardner. If everyone could please rise and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. We bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege, this moment, and this opportunity. We come in this opportunity to ask for grace and wisdom for these councilmen and councilwomen. We ask that you would give them knowledge, guidance, and direction for the well-being of the city and all sectors. We pray that you would give them wisdom and understanding and foresight above their human understanding or even their academic matriculation. We ask God that you would divinely put your hand on this city, direct this city in the direction and the place where you would have it to be, where all of the citizens are being blessed and, and all of the citizens are experiencing the beauty of life by living in this great city. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for the protection. We see storms have come and you favor Tampa and we give you praise and glory and honor for that. And we ask God that even for our social storms, our civil storms, our economic storms, we thank you, Father, for all levels of storms that you would show us that same grace and that your hand would touch, control, and guide the hearts of these members. This is what we do pray, and we ask this in your loving name, Jesus. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be 
be seated. <coughs> Roll call. Carlson. Here. Vieira. Here. Maniscalco. Here. Pertec. Here. Goobs. Miranda. Here. And Citro. Citro. Here. We have a physical form. <laughs> Mr. Shelby. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, members of City Council, members of the public. Martin Shelby, City Council's attorney. Uh, today, the public and the city um, of Tampa residents are able to watch this meeting on Spectrum Channel 640, Frontier Channel 15, and on the internet at tampa.gov forward slash live stream. Members of the public can attend in person in council's chambers here at 315 East Kennedy Boulevard or participate virtually by using what is referred to by the state of Florida and rules as communications media technology. The way to do that is uh, through uh, pre-registering and those instructions are available in the agenda, in the notice, and on the city's website at tampa.gov forward slash city council. That being the case, Mr. Chairman, I am asking you to um, waive the rules to allow the CMT. We have a motion made by Councilman Good, seconded by Council. Maniscalco. <clears throat> All in favor? Aye. Thank you. We will now go through the approval of the agenda and the addendums of the agenda. <coughs> Did you want to um, go over the items on the agenda at this point in time with the staff reports? Uh, and uh, I understand the chief of staff has prepared something uh, to assist you, or do you wish to just? Um, uh, uh, the chief and I have already made an eye contact, and I'm hoping that uh, the chief is going to step up to the podium at this time. More than happy to. Just waiting for. Thank you very much, chief. <laughs> Here's a hard copy if council wishes to follow along. Put it on the, the overhead to see if that helps as well. This is just a. Uh, an attempt to try and support council in a very busy, complex agenda today. I'll wait till everybody has a copy. When we did the agenda review, first of all, John Bennett, Chief of Staff, good morning, council, good morning, public. Um, when we did the agenda review yesterday and the final draft came out, there, <coughs> there seemed to settle 26 staff reports, which is obvious, obviously voluminous. Um, so I took the opportunity after hours last night to throw this staff report matrix together. And if it's council's pleasure, we can walk through this and this may compress the staff reports without removing any of the content, but helping move the agenda along. So if council's pleasure, I'll walk through this and see if it's agreeable. Absolutely, please proceed. All right. So probably the best thing to do is uh, if you see what's on the overhead, I added row numbers and I apologize. I didn't think of that last night when I was typing this up. But if you look at the, to stay in chronological order for the public's sake, if you look at the footnote, items three through 10 are really staff reports that are based on action items that you typically have a dollar amount with them. So I'll move past those first three through 10. The way they're bundled on this matrix is by the staff lead. So that way everything could be bundled together for that particular staff member of council's pleasure. But item 11, you can see down in row number nine, that belongs to a uh, city council, so that way it could be presented there. Item 12, and I, I put the motion maker there in case there's any feedback from the motion maker. Um, so item 12 also is a city council item in row nine. Item 13 is a, uh, a TPD item, and again, I think uh, city, uh, city attorney Megan Newcomb is here, as well as uh, Deputy Chief Calvin Johnson. There's no action required on that, and there is a memorandum. So I don't know if you want to carry these as far as what you normally do and say, yes, you need the person here. So I'm just going to assume the staff will be here until I hear otherwise. Item 14 is um, it's in row three under Administrator Wynn. Item 15 is on row number four with Director Biday. Item number 16 is a request to continue. You can see that in item eight, or row eight, I apologize. Item 17, you can see also in row eight, 
18 and 19 and 20 are also in row eight, and many of those require a continuance. So I think those could be moved in a block if council and Mr. Shelby agree with that. When we get to item 21, um, obviously that's up in row four, again with Director B Day. So if those two are handled together, that can move that quickly. Item 22 is also with Administrator Wynn in row three. So again, when Ms. When Ms. Wynn is up, if you want to handle 14 and 22 together, that could be compressed. Item 23, as you note, is also a council item in row nine. Item 24, <clears throat> 25, 26, and 27, um, I adopted those so I could bundle those together because they have like content. And I was going to suggest presenting that under administrator update at item three because it might have some benefit for council for some of the rest of the items. And then finally, when we get to item 28, that again is a council item. So if it's council's pleasure, uh, and this doesn't necessarily describe the order from top to bottom, just saying that when those items come up in a bundle, you would have the administrator's attention for both of those items. On the far right, I put the fact that there's action required or not. And that doesn't mean that council may not take action. It just means that the ones that say yes require some sort of a vote today to move it forward. So if council's pleasure to follow this sequence, either by number or by staff member, uh, we're prepared to do either one. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Uh, Mr. Bennett, my my understanding was that uh, you all would like to continue number 24. Um, I know you said you might address it, but yeah, so I'm going to address all of those together if that's okay. And, and so we're going to talk about it today, or we'll continue it okay. during the discussion. I wanted to bring it up today, and then um, let me go back to 24. We, could we just for just for brevity, could we just go ahead and continue it, and then and then? Yeah, I'd like to bring, I'd like to bring it up. Make sure I'm talking. I mean, you about can the still right talk thing. about it in your admin report. But oh yeah, that's but fine. If we're not going to vote on it, it has yeah, to. perfect. Um, and and then I, uh, I I I'd ask I think by memo to continue 15 and 16. Correct. When, when we run when we run through the agenda items, we will do so at that time. Okay. So item 15 was a request to continue as well. Yeah, 15 is really tied to 16. Understood. Okay. All right. So are we running through the agenda item right now? Please. Go ahead. So that, it, that everybody understands what we want. I like the matrix. Fair enough. It's shovel. Mr. Chairman, did you still want to go through these because each one has an extensive memorandum attached to it that may solve the problem and not have to do the presentation? That's, that's what I just said. We're going to. That's really what I thought I heard. Through yeah. it, okay? I understand that. And, Thank I'm, you. and I am going to ask to be uh, maker of the motions if the uh, memos that they have received from staff are adequate for them. Also, but also it's also a question for every member of council because Correct. once it's a motion of council, it really is. If anybody else has a question, that certainly could resolve. If they want to have staff present, they certainly can raise that. And Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you want to start at 11 because everything up to 11 require a vote because it's a monetized well, item. We just we're just again you you're asking into your staff uh, reports. For your administration update for 24, 25, 26, and 27 to be heard at the same time. Correct. Thank you. And then. Item four was a request to continue. And there is no uh, time certain on that, correct? That's correct. All right. Mr. Chairman, on item four. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Forgive me. I recognize, sir. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Councilman Goods, you are recognized. Thank you, sir. Item number four, I know there's a request for continuous, but we have State Representative Hardis here who wants to speak on that item. Uh, so I don't know if staff uh, uh, wants to uh, actually hear from Ms. Hart or not, but she is here and she is, I guess, giving some items to council members as well. Uh, something is happening. So uh, I don't have a problem with continuing, but uh, Ms. Hart is here and would like sense. to speak on that item. I think it's great. Okay. Make and sure. also, uh, four and five I want to talk about. Mr. Chairman, Mr. It, Shelby. it would be my recommendation that you keep it on the agenda until you hear at least what the public might have Thank to you, say Mr. with it. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Thank you. Yep. 
Items number five, six, and seven will be heard together. Five, five as a standalone, six, seven, and eight would be heard six, together. Six, seven, and eight will be heard together. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, and that's under uh, the CFO, Rojero. Mr. Chair. Councilman Carlson. Uh, Mr. Bennett, yes. um, I know you're going to talk about transparency today. Uh, number six um, doesn't have a dollar amount, but when you pull up the backup, it's there's a higher number, but the, the main number is $312 million. And it, it seems to me like that should be continued because the number was not there. Uh, number seven also is $61 million. And I, I think if we're going to have a numbers that big it, it, for whatever, that the number should be in the, in the disclosure in the summary so the public can quickly see it. And so I, you, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. I'm not going to make a motion. I'll leave it up to you. But my recommendation for transparency reasons would be to continue until next week. Uh, Thank Chief you. Chief I'd like to defer to the administrator handling it. But I appreciate the comments. Real quickly on those items, and I understand that there, there are reimbursement resolutions we do have, Mr. Miller, here to talk about what these resolutions mean in the recitals, it indicates that we may be seeking a bond issuance up to that amount, but that these resolutions don't approve that that amount. It's just that we're looking at uh, starting certain projects in advance of the, the bond issuance. And if we issue the bonds, and again, Mr. Miller's here to explain it, we have to have these resolutions passed so that we can go ahead and pay for those projects out of the bond issuance. So that's how it, how this works. Yeah, and when we get to it, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll ask a lot of questions sure. for the public. But but my point is that the public, it, we have lots of uh, people in the public that read the agenda, right. and had they seen the three hundred twelve million dollar number or the sixty one million dollar number, it would have it would have caught their attention. Um, luckily, I read all the backup and saw it. But um, whatever it's for, I think the public needs to know what the numbers are. And so my again, I'll leave it up to you. My suggestion is that we continue until next week just to give the public a chance you to want to make that a motion no I said I'll leave then it let's up let's move forward please I'll leave it up to then let's Bennett. move forward please uh, we're now at number nine correct thank you number nine is uh, requested to move forward and requires a vote and Ms. Ten. Feely's here for that number 10 chief number 10 again requires a vote and 11. director Conklin's here <clears throat> Number 11 is council's item. 12. 12 again is a item for council to discuss. Councilman Goods, that is your motion. At 12, you said? It's yes, the sir. budget advisor. Right, budget. yes, yes, yes. Thank you. 13. Item 13 Kira, is for the police department and they're present. Okay. Recommend going forward on that. Thank you. 14. Councilman Vieira, that's also yours. Um, no staff needed. I'll make comments on it, um, including uh, on the uh, groundbreaking uh, and other issues, but, uh, but no, no, no staff needed for that. Thank you very much. 15. Cal 15 Carlson. and 16, a request to continue. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to continue 15 and 16 Second. to be seen together in staff reports on March 16th. On March 16th, I had down here uh, February 23rd, so you're saying March 16th? Yeah, please. That's 15 and 16, correct? Yes, please. Thank together. you, Councilman Carlson. Number 17, Chief. That's going to be I'm sorry. Motion made by Councilman Carlson. Seconded by Councilwoman Hurtak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Thank you. 17, Chief. Chairman, 17 through 20 have a recommendation to continue, but they have different dates uh, tied to those. So I don't know if you want to take them one at a time for a continuance. There is a continuance on uh, item agenda item number 17 to October 27th. Well, well, let me, let me, oh, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Goods. We've been kicking 17 down the road. So if we're going to continue this, I want to make sure we're going to have this, uh, some recommendations. Uh, and whatever, so we can move this forward before the first of the year with the, uh, the community benefits agreement. So, uh, Mr. Job. Well, actually, I'll wait for the chair to recognize. I believe it's only going to be continued until one week to the 27th. <coughs> okay. It's on the agenda till the 27th. I just correct? want to make sure we're going to have some resolve on the 27th for that item. Mm, Mr. Chairman. I know it's a workshop, but Mr. I. Mr. Shelby. I, 
I mean, Mrs. Mrs. Dringle, Shelby, me please. Yes. Councilman Goods, I was going to make a recommendation. I could hold this for new business, but with regard to the order of the workshop next week, it is primarily a land development and a lot of continuances. I would ask that those be all grouped together at the start of the meeting, including this motion, so that there's no question that will be taken care of early and grouped together as all land development items and taken early in the workshop because they are of major significance. I have no problem with that. I saw Mr. Drumgo coming up, but I want to make sure I address the issue. Of, he said of the he's ready. Yeah. Mr. Goods, he's ready. Okay, so we'll be ready. All right, sir, thank you. We have a motion made by Councilman Goods. Second. Seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Agenda item number 18 has been asked to be continued until February 23rd. So moved. Second. A motion made by Councilman Maniscalco. Seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Agenda item number 19 has been asked to uh, continue until February 23rd. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco. Second by Councilman Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Agenda item number 20 has been asked to uh, continue to the 27th. Moved by Councilman Maniscalco. Seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Item 21 has a memorandum from Director B. Day. And if I may, Mr. Chair? Surely. I'm content with that. You are good with the uh, memo from uh, Mr. B. Day. Yes, sir. And everyone, I may, I may address it in the future, but we'll find Everyone on council is also uh, good with the uh, memo sent by Mr. B. Day. Yes, sir. Thank you. We'll strike uh, 21. 22. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, if you can. Uh, instead of striking it, I'd ask that you just do a motion to receive and file, and that would handle that. So now. Move to receive and file 2021. 20, move to receive and file by Councilman Mascalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Agenda item number 22, that is Council, Councilman Maniscalco. Yes, sir. With 22, uh, I ask that, of course, somebody be present. But also item 35, if you notice, it's a $100,000 uh, item to a firm that is out of, the, out of town, but uh, to study the um, uh, trash-free Tampa Bay case study. My question is, one of the questions is going to be, why do we have to pay somebody $100,000 to study our trash issue that's not you know it's out of town so if, if we could have item number 35 pulled and added to the number 22 discussion mm -hmm. since it all fits into the littering I'll second that because that, that was going to be my motion so yeah oh, okay. <laughs> motion by councilman Maniscalco seconded by councilwoman Hurtak all in favor Aye. Aye. thank you judge uh, 23 that is Miss Miranda 23. yes sir Oh, yes. And that came from the clerk, so Mr. I don't know Chair. if it's a receipt and file or a discussion. Councilman Carlson. Um, we don't have to do it today, but um, uh, Ms. Miranda, uh, uh, Councilman Miranda asked for this. And, um, uh, you know, I, several of us were on the board, but I'm just curious as he reviews it sometime in the future, what his conclusions are, if he has any, if you gain any insights. We can talk about it on the charter day, but. I'd just be curious as you read through it if you have any insights or anything. We can certainly do whatever. Can we keep everyone on that? I just want to make sure everything is uh, it Unless he's ready today, we could just receive and file today. Well, I have I have documents as well that uh, if, to, to, to distribute to council. I could do it today or I could do it another day, but it's the clerk has prepared them as well. So if you, I, I'd ask that you keep it on the agenda. It should you take know, over. This was four or five years ago, if I recall. Right. Now it will be we can but I haven't gotten to that point yet so I, I don't mind having this held for a week so we can all be up to date on it and discuss what happened how they vote whoever the members were there was about 10 or 12 weren't they and uh, yeah we had nine I think but I, Carlson. Um, the other thing is that um, city attorney maybe a year ago gave me a uh, file with all the audio recordings and my legislative aide has it so to the extent that I don't need the audio if you all want to listen to it no I appreciate it though it's fine so are, what, what are you proposing, Councilman Miranda, for uh, Just one, if you can hold it for a week. For October 23rd, correct? Yeah. October, next week, is a, next week is a workshop meeting. Yeah. And, then, and, then the, and then the Tuesday after that is the charter workshop. So I'm, I'm going to ask that you keep that on the agenda if you can. If it has to be continued, that'll be fine. And it could be taken up very quickly at the end. Councilman Hurtak. Um, from my understanding, this is just presenting the minutes, which we already have. Uh, I don't know about you, but I got a giant binder. 
I mean, yes, we're not talking about it. From my understanding, this is just that we are getting it. Yeah, and from my it. understanding, Mr. Shelby has something to add to it. So basically, all we, all we would be doing is accepting what he has to give and yep. then just move on. That's fine. Right? Thank you. Okay. Jen. Councilman Goods. Uh, Mr. Cohen, I'd like to have that on. If you already have it, I'd like to. Uh, yeah, to, are we, um, is, is it okay if my aide gives him the thing to listen to? Sure, the clerk can. It's an MP3. It's drive. a thumb drive. Yeah. If, the clerk, if the clerk made it, I'd like to get a copy of the, uh, the audio. Thank you. I might have a copy as well. I could give it to you. That'd be great. But it runs a long time. Yeah. That's okay. Sorry. <laughs> we like the audio. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item number 24, that is Councilman Carlson's. That one, um, I was proposing continuing, and then you said you want to leave it on the agenda. So, so that's where, Chairman, I was going to talk about all four of these together. I was going to talk about and 25 and 27 together, right. and then right next to that, 24 and 26. Then let's go to 28. That's Councilman Hertak. Um, Yes. Uh, Thank you. All right. That clears up everything to the consent. Second. That's for 130. That's when we will open all those, those things. All right. Move to go. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair, I just want to make sure to Councilman Maniscalco's question about 22 and 35. Uh, Administrator Wynn will be here. As far as the solid waste goes, we'll either have Deputy Administrator Ruggiero here or I need to get Director uh, Larry Washington here to join her since Thank it's you. a solid waste item. Thank you very so much. So I'll get them here before that comes up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Carlson. We have several hearings later in the day that are going to have a lot of uh, public comment. Um, 89 is one of them. Should we try to give the public and the participants um, some expectations? One of them is. Um, 84 may have a lot, and then there's one that has to do with High Park um, Historic Preservation. Is there is there any way we can give any guidance to the, uh, that's 67. So 67, 84, and 89, uh, any any chance that we could give some guidance to the people in the room as to when we'll bring those back? Well, it depends on how much council wants to talk about each item beforehand. I don't think we can give any time certain. I'm very quiet. Uh, again, again, it depends on how much time the council wants to talk about the items that are coming before them. Not now. I agree with Ms. Crawford, but as we go through the agenda by 11 30, quarter to 12, we have an expectation of yes. what time we're going to be. We can yes. say it then. But I agree with you. All right. Move to approve the agenda. The agenda. Thank you very much. Councilman uh, uh, made a motion to approve the agenda. Councilman Good seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have presentations and ceremonial activities right now. <coughs> Councilman Good. Good morning again, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. This morning we have the distinguished pleasure of recognizing again one of our ATU employees. We have Aminta Owens here, uh, who works in the uh, Architectural and Review uh, Historic Preservation Division. And uh, reading uh, some of the things that they're saying about him, you're going to find them very interesting. So I'll let Mr. Simon. From her first position as an Office Support Specialist three to obtaining certification from the International Code Council to serve as the city's historic preservation certified code officer, enforcement officer. To her most recent promotion as a historic preservation technician, she continues to excel in her professional responsibilities while maintaining a commitment to accuracy and a positive attitude. Aminta supports the division's administration of the Barrio Latino Commission, the Architectural Review Commission, and the Historic Preservation Commission. Her effort is continually acknowledged by the division's internal and external customers. 
Aminta is the heart and soul behind the division's latest version of the designated local historic landmarks, districts, and multiple properties, cataloging Tampa's history in a meaningful visual documentation that will serve as a resource for generations to come to understand Tampa's past. Aminta Owen is a dedicated and passionate employee who is always first to assist another team member with a complicated project or to help a client to resolve a problem. With over two decades of service to the Architectural Review and Historic Preservation Division and the citizens of Tampa, Aminta exemplifies the impact that one person can make in transforming Tampa's tomorrow while preserving the achievements of its past. And so we, ATU Local 1464 <laughs> would like to present you with a token of our appreciation for doing what you do to keep the city of Tampa running, a $100 gift card. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, this morning, the Tampa City Council Accommodation presented to Amenta Owen, HR Employee of the Month. The City Council of the City of Tampa is proud to present this accommodation to Amenta Owen, who exemplifies the type of employee who everyone admires, respects, and cheers to success. You're a great asset to the City of Tampa. Presented today, the 19th day of October 2022. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I just say quickly, Abby Feely, Deputy Administrator, Development and Growth Management. I have a large team. It's close to 200 and growing. But I just want to say that each individual employee really <coughs> brings to the table their own unique skills and talents. And Aminta just, I said, she shows up every day to get it done and is wearing a smile no matter where you see her. And what she's done in our historic preservation and architectural review team is just um, really a detriment to, to her commitment to service to the city. And we're so, so happy for her to have this recognition. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have some goodies for some folks today. Good morning, Council. Donna McBride with Strath Center. Ms. Owens, Ms. Owen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for your service and in particular for preserving our history. It's so important to where we've been and where we're going. So thank you very much. We'd thank like you. you to enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next up. Good morning, Council. I'm Grace Gonzalez. I'm representing the Gonsmart family and the 1905 family of restaurants. Ms. Owen, thank you so much for all the work you do for the city of Tampa. We're so grateful for everything you do. Uh, the, on behalf of the Gonsmart family, we'd like to present you with a gift card. For the first time, we have a universal gift card to all the 1905 family of restaurant units. So you can use this at Goody Goody, Ulele, <laughs> Casa Santo Stefano, Columbia Restaurant, anywhere you'd like. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've known Amenta for, for a long time, Steve Michelini, by the way, <clears throat> and I can assure you that she does get the job done. Whether it's in the field or in the office, uh, she's always there to assist. So uh, that's greatly appreciated as someone that you can really count on, especially late in the day when you have a question about some piece of property that you need to get resolved right away. Um, she and, her and the rest of the staff are there to help. So she is greatly appreciated. Um, <clears throat> on behalf of Bella Brava Restaurant Group, we're going to provide you with gift certificates so you can go enjoy yourself over there. Uh, on behalf of the Tampa Metropolitan YMCA, you can go and enjoy yourself at the Y with a complimentary membership. On behalf of the Yummy House Bistro, uh, now don't let Dennis and Ron and, you know, get, a, get a hold of this one, but, but the, you know, they might try to talk you out of this one. Um, Yummy House China Bistro, you can go enjoy yourself over there for lunch or dinner. And on behalf of the Chicho Restaurant Group, we're going to provide you with a gift certificate so you can enjoy yourself with breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And then the meat market in uh, Old Hyde Park, you can go yourself, enjoy yourself for dinner. So uh, here are those gift certificates go along with that. And here are the letters. Thank you. And Thank don't, you let them, don't let them talk you out no, of that No, you know better than that. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Here comes, here comes my favorite, the game balls. My, the game ball. We thank Brian for 
Absolutely. Bring that new asset to our A2 employees because you're special as well, just like our police and fire first responders. Brian. Thank you, Councilman. Good morning, Council. Brian Ford, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and as Councilman uh, referenced, uh, on behalf of the Glazer family and our entire organization, we have a tradition over at One Buck, and whenever anybody goes over and above, they get a game ball. And Ms. Owen, based on your story, we have a little game ball for you. So congratulations. Oh. <laughs> thank, thank you and your family for all that you do for the, uh, for the city and the community. Congratulations. Oh, I'm, I'm humbled and overwhelmed. I, uh, um, this is quite unexpected and appreciated. I want to thank you all for um, giving me the opportunity with the city and allowing me to grow. Um, and thank you all, especially my, my team. They're the best. Appreciate it. And my sister, who happens to be here also. So um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the Buccaneers have outdone themselves. I mean, I didn't notice the ATU emblem on the ball. And her name, gentlemen. But thank you again, Brian Glazer. I'm sorry, Councilman. I have one other thing, Aminta, if you don't mind, before you go. Uh, also got a letter from the mayor, if you don't mind. I'd like to read it. Okay. Okay. Congratulations on being selected as the ATU Employee of the Month for your professionalism, strong work ethics, and for going above and beyond in all aspects in your position as a historic preservation technician. You have demonstrated a firm commitment and high standards from your hire date in 2001 as an Office Support Specialist three, and you soon thereafter became a member of the Architectural Review and Historic Preservation Division where your dedication has ensured Tampa's unique history is safeguarded for future generations. Your responsibilities include supporting the Barrio Latino Commission, Architectural Review Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, and you are charged with the documentation of the division's designated local historic landmarks, district, and multiple properties, whereby your efforts will visually contact, uh, catalog our city's past. You have earned the respect of your superiors, peers, and community, and well known as someone who is dedicated, passionate, and result-oriented. You are an integral part of the city's mission of providing superior services, and your proficiency and outstanding positive attitude make you highly deserving of this recognition. You are an asset to the city of Tampa, the development and growth management department, and to our community. You are admired, well-respected, and set a shining example for others to follow. It is employees like you, Amenta, that make me proud to serve as mayor. Thank you for your dedication and service. Sincerely, Jane Castor. Mr. Chairman? Would any council members like to make any? Councilman Maniscalco, and then I, we'll go to Councilman. Ron Moran. No, M&M, &M, going, you're going to go first. Maniscalco, first. <laughs> well, Mr. Okay. Simon, you, uh, you said it all with the words of our mayor. We appreciate you. You're a member of this uh, City of Tampa family, and uh, we appreciate all your hard work and dedication. When I heard historic preservation, my ears perked up, and um, I appreciate all that you do. and, and you know, protecting the, 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 the city, the history of the city, the story of the city. People don't realize the importance of it, especially what you and your office and, and your team members do. Uh, we appreciate you. So this is a very, very well-deserved honor. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, following what Mr. Maniscalco said, congratulations. As we heard all your duties that you have, you're very well multitasked in doing not one thing, but various things. And the model of 1464 is we keep Tampa moving. Yeah. Well, I hope it doesn't go too far. <laughs> but you're doing a great job, and uh, it's an unbelievable thing. You know, things that you guys do in that local uh, are not talked about too often, but without you, we wouldn't be the city that we are. All of you, all of you in 1464, congratulations, not only to you, but to your staff and everyone that keeps you going in the direction that you're doing. Buenas suerte. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for all that you do. And I'm so glad that, that we can continue to honor our ATU employees. That's something that is so important. You're a good example of the, the work that y'all do every day on core city assignments and, and tasks. So just thank you for all that you do. And I hope that this day is special for you. Thank you very much. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I w also want to say thank you. Uh, but I just want to mention the fact that I'm, I'm super impressed that you started 
you know, just uh, in one spot, and then you've worked really hard to get to where you are. And I just, I like to think of that as the growth that, that any employee can have in the city of Tampa, and I think you exemplify that. And it's a really good role model for people who join the city who say, okay, I'm here, but I can always keep growing. And I, I think that's incredibly impressive. So thank you so much, uh, and thank you for continuing to grow with the city of Tampa. We really appreciate it. Thank you. House McCross. I know you know this, but um, for anybody watching, you know, when people are looking to visit a city for tourism or to invest in a city or really relocate in a city, sure they look at the shiny new buildings, but mostly what they really care about is the history and culture of a community, which is many times defined in part by the, by the um, historic buildings and architecture. And I'm embarrassed that I don't know you and I look forward to getting to know you, but you're working in an area that I love and I'm so happy that you and your team are doing this. We need to protect our history and tell the stories and, and make sure all the new folks um, know about uh, Tampa's rich history and culture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being part of the city of Tampa family. Thank you for all the hard work you do. Thank you for keeping our rich and vibrant history alive. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Vieira. Mr. Chairman, it's my great uh, pleasure today to do the uh, Tampa Police Officer of the Month commendation uh, to Corporal Monty. Um, this is something that we do every single month in Tampa City Council and like so many other endeavors, sir, it, it reflects the values of the constituents and the communities that we serve. We serve in a city, uh, Mr. Chairman, that is very pro-first responder and that also includes pro-police officer. Good to see you. Pro-police officer. Um, we, we salute the work of our police officers who are the protectors uh, here in our city of Tampa and who do so much into running into situations that most, the vast majority of people, starting with myself, would run away from. So we, uh, we support that 110%. And we have here Deputy Chief Johnson who would like to say some words. Go ahead, sir. How you doing? Good morning, Council. Good morning. Police work covers many aspects from being a crime fighter to being a guardian and somebody with the passion for the community. And I'm going to read some stuff here today that she embodies all of it. And she goes above and beyond and got a really big heart really for the community and our juveniles. Corporal Jamie Lee Monte is committed to reducing crime through a work in District 2. She continuously shows that she believes in leading from the front as a supervisor. That philosophy was exemplified in a recent carjacking and kidnapping case. A wanted suspect went on what can only be described as a crime spree. After holding a firearm to a victim's head and demanding her car, the suspect went to a second location where he kicked in the door of a residence and kidnapped a different victim who later escaped. At a third location, he stole a large box truck from a third victim who was out making deliveries. This series of events happened early in the morning hours when Corporal Monty was just responding to work and listening to radio traffic. When she saw what she believed to be the stolen box truck, she coordinated with dispatch, air service, and her squad to discreetly get behind the driver. As the vehicle left Tampa's jurisdiction, Corporal Monty stayed with it continuing to observe the drive as he went north on I-75 to Gainesville. After a lengthy pursuit with the Latchewood County deputies, the defendant was ultimately stopped and arrested. Corporal Monty was on the scene assisting with the search warrant of the stolen vehicle. Her efforts led to the defendant being charged with numerous felonies across the state. Her great work doesn't stop there. This past month, her squad obtained probable cause for another armed carjacking case by showing a photo array. They recovered a crucial video on a kidnapping and child abuse investigation. 
and they assisted on a residential search warrant for animal cruelty. Their efforts led to the arrest in each of these cases. Lastly, Corporal Monty is a true community police officer. This summer, she coordinated multiple field days at various parks throughout the city and assisted with the implementation of summer stay and play program. This program gave over 200 Tampa juveniles an opportunity to engage with law enforcement and participate in basketball, kickball, dodgeball, and various other healthy activities. She has doubled the participation in our Shop with the Cop program. One thing about Shop with the Cop program, we had it at, I think, West Shore Mall. Um, so many kids didn't sign up for it, but they showed up. She made sure that those kids were taken care of at the spur of the moment. And, you know, when I saw that as a chief, it just touched my heart. It really made those kids' days. The Shop with the Cop program provided back to school clothing for approximately 39 children and worked to form two bowling teams for our Bowl for Kids Challenge. Her passion for the youth and dedication to creating and improving the quality of life for all citizens is why we have selected Corporal Jamie Lynn Monty as our Officer of the Month. Corporal, um, on behalf of a grateful city and Tampa City Council, it is our great pleasure to give you this Tampa City Council commendation for all the work that you have done and all the work you continue to do and all the sacrifices you take with you and your family. God Thank bless you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And before you speak, we have some uh, gifts from the community here that are a good symbol of the support that you have. Thank so you. Go ahead. Hey, hey. Uh, Brandon Barclay, Vice President, Tampa PBA Council. Thank you for having us this morning. We're here to present this plaque to Corporal Monty for uh, doing an excellent job as always. Thank Appreciate you. it. Council members, Corporal Monty, I can't even express enough thanks for what you're doing for our community to make it safer every day and your determination to make sure that that happens. You put your life on the line every day and, and we are grateful, extremely grateful for your service as we try to raise our children and our community and have a good quality of life. We cannot do it without you. Thank you, Thank you very much. The Strata Center would like for you to relax and enjoy your show. <laughs> Thank you. Morning Council, Corporal, uh, Bob Turner with the uh, Mustang Club of Tampa, Grace Thomas from uh, Bill Curry Ford, and we've got a few goodies here for you. Got um, for your current vehicle, free oil change at Bill Curry Ford. When you're ready for your next vehicle, $500 coupon off your next Ford vehicle at Bill Curry Ford. And to help you select that Ford, a free weekend with a uh, Ford of your choice, I'd go for a full-size Bronco. <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. Get it, get it nice and dirty. Talk to him about paying for it. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and finally, from the uh, Mustang Club of Tampa, your very own uh, Mustang patrol car, uh, celebrating your recognition of Officer of the Month. Thank you. So thank you very much. We really appreciate the service. Corporal Monty, Grace Gonzalez with the 1905 Family of Restaurants representing the Gonsmart family. Thank you so much for your service and all that you do for the city of Tampa. We uh, would like to present you with a $100 gift card to the 1905 Family of Restaurants, so that includes any Columbia restaurant location in the state of Florida, Ulele, Casa Santo, Stefano, and Ebor, Cha-Cha Coconuts in Sarasota, or uh, Goody Goody in Hyde Park. Thank you. Enjoy. It. Thank you so much. <laughs> Morning, Council. Mike MacArthur, Steps Towing Service Officer. Congratulations on a job well done. Uh, the, the things that you're doing for our youth is priceless, and 
uh, as a community, we can't thank you enough. So on behalf of Todd Step and Steps Towing Service, I'd like to present you a gift card to a, a dinner or a restaurant of your choice and a night out in our company limousine. So if you got an event coming up, please take advantage of it. Enjoy some time off and congratulations. Thank you. I thank appreciate you. it. Yeah. Council. I'm actually Wendy Galeris. I'm a detective with the city of Tampa. Um, Pete Burby's my other half and he couldn't be here this morning so he asked me since Jamie is my best friend to come present these on behalf of Bush Gardens Tampa Bay and Neil Thurman and Pete Brevy. So here are four complimentary tickets to Bush Gardens. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Mary Lou Bailey. I'm Mark Haney with Zoo Tampa. And um, I'm here on behalf of the volunteers who serve on the board at Zoo Tampa. We thank you for your effort. We very much value our community and the contribution, and we thank your family for sharing you with our community. And on behalf of the board of directors, we're presenting you with an annual uh, membership to uh, Zoo Tampa. So go and enjoy with friends and family. I would go to Creatures of the Night as soon as you can, because it's Halloween, and it includes <laughs> that. It's a lot of fun. But we want to thank you for your tremendous service and, and your tremendous heart. And, and you already deal with a lot of creatures of the night in your job, yeah. so um, it, it'll, be, it'll be a little less stressful maybe, yeah, and, yeah, and more yeah. fun, so yeah. congratulations. Thank you. So Thank, you Thank you again. Morning, Christmas. Council, Chief. Chief. Um, again, on behalf of the Glazer family and our entire organization, we just want to say thank you for your sacrifice, your family's sacrifice, and all you do for the community. We have a little tradition, a game ball, and your credentials definitely uh, warrant this. So thank, thank you very you so much. much. Congratulations, and thank you. All right, thank you. We need, we need a bigger basket. <laughs> One of the things that I think that just clearly demonstrates is that you don't want to mess with the women at TPD. <laughs> um, on behalf of the Chicho's Restaurant Group, we're providing you with a gift certificate so you can enjoy yourself over there, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. On behalf of Bella Brava, which is in the Midtown section, we're providing you with a gift certificate for lunch or dinner. On behalf of Meat Market in Old Hyde Park Village, we're providing you with a gift certificate for your enjoyment, lunch or dinner. And the Yummy House China Bistro, again, lunch or dinner, you're going to have a lot of friends. <laughs> and, and the YMCA is providing you with a gift certificate as well. So congratulations, and uh, I can't tell you how proud we are of you and the other women and also the, all of the men that provide our support and uh, safety in the, in the uh, private sector and the, all these places. I mean, they, if you show up in uniform, they'll, they'll treat you right. Congratulations. Thank you. So as, as you can see, uh, Corporal Monty is respected, she is appreciated, and by the many people here, uh, she is loved. So if you'd like to speak, you may. Um, thank you to Council um, for recognizing me and for, the, for my staff. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this if my staff didn't allow me to have all these crazy ideas when it came to the community and help me execute it. Um, they've supported me 100% since I moved to the community squad. Um, also, my squad, who is here, um, I definitely would not be able to do everything without their backing. Um, they make me look great on a daily basis. <laughs> And to my husband, who is a former former Tampa police officer, um, being able to have his support because he has to listen to all the crazy stuff when I come home. So I definitely appreciate them. So I, I definitely appreciate this. To everybody that gave me something, um, I also appreciate that. So thank you guys very much, and have a good day. Councilman Carlson. Just quickly, um, thank you for your creativity, your drive, obviously, and your leadership. The fact that everybody showed up shows you're a great leader also. But thanks mostly for keeping us safe. Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you for uh, putting on that uniform each and every day and for the sacrifice that you make and to the sacrifice that your family makes. Your husband understands as he was here uh, with TPD. Uh, thank you for thinking outside the box and uh, really reaching out to the community and inspiring not just our young people, but us in general. You go above and beyond, and certainly you deserve this recognition because people recognize the extra work that you do on top of everything that you do. So we appreciate you. This is very well deserved. Keep up the great work, and uh, thanks. Councilwoman Hurtak. 
Um, I also echo everyone's thanks, but I really, um, as a former teacher, I, I really appreciate and can, can relate to anybody who has a special focus for children. So I want to say thank you so much for, for your focus on the children in the community and making their lives better and providing that connection with an officer that, that helps them um, be more comfortable in their community and get to know everyone who can keep them safe. So thank you so much. Thank you. Councilman Goose. Thank you, Chairman. I always say in communities when police bond with citizens and bond with young people, it curtails a lot of violence. Officers know the community. They know the kids. And, uh, Chief Bennett might know we first started the Weed and Seed program back in 91, 92. I had all the basketball programs and we'll park that police car and go to all the neighborhoods and pick the kids up and we had all the tournaments. <laughs> Start all the football programs. People know good people. And no matter where you're at, they see you. I'm at restaurants, hey coach, Officer G, coaching at the high schools. That's why I always say, you know, I was sad when Powell went away from our communities. When I was a boy, Powell was in every city park. Police officers coaching. You guys wouldn't know Larry Siegel. He was the heart and soul of uh, the Police Athletic League. That's why I always say it, it needs to come back. Those type of atmospheres need to come back to communities. We can curtail a lot of our violence with our young people because they'll start to bond with every young person wants to be successful. Don't never think they don't. They just need good people to show them and talk in their ear about how to be successful. And it's just not black people. It's, it's all people, white people, Hispanic people. You know, Every young person wants to be successful. They just got to have somebody who they believe because, see, you can't tell them something and not fulfill the commitment because they'll think you're just a liar like the absent dad or the absent mom they got. And they go and they steal, they rob because they're hungry. But they're not hungry when people actually show their commitment and love to them. So, Jamie, I, I know you when you first came on. When, we, when we, Assistant Chief Calvin first came on. Proud of you guys have risen and doing the things you do with young people. I know Calvin, he goes out, get, you know, he, he gets the kids uh, haircuts. Appreciate that. They need that. But thank you for what you do, Jamie, and, and your squad of giving initiatives and programs. And again, I tell Chief Ben, I'll tell the mayor, uh, somehow we got to get more officers to get pal back in some of those things and, and with our recreation department, which is so valuable because it starts in the parks. And you'll be able to tell some of the violence because they'll start to be able to, to build and build in themselves. So thank you for what you do, Jamie. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor for you to be here today representing not only yourself, your family, but the whole community and your squad and everyone else. And I agree with uh, Councilman Goods, what he said. Uh, parks and uh, knowing the other side means a lot more. And the public really in general doesn't understand what the police officer does. They think you just give tickets every day. But you're also cursed at you're spit at. There's a lot of things that go around that says, how much am I going to take? So there's a lot of reasoning for people not to want to be a police officer. And right now, what's happening in this country, we're happening in the whole world. They think that when you fire a gun, you're not going to kill no one. And they're wrong. And it's happening more and more often all over this country. And somehow, the parents, the home, the parks has got to start changing and start understanding. And be mindful of who they're talking to, how they talk to. Kids are looking for a way to get better, not to get worse. But in my opinion, once a kid gets about 12 years old and you haven't got to them, you lost them. And I'll tell you why. Because they hang around with 14, 15, and 16, and 17 year olds that are doing something that he or she has never seen. And they're putting them in and they can't get out. And that's one of the problems we have. And from experience, it's a thing that uh, if you want your end, you're not going to change. I used to go quite often to go speak to the kids at the jail there in Falkenberg Road. And finally, I gave up because I knew when they came out, they didn't have anywhere else to go but where they came from. And once you do that, you're not solving any problems at all. So thank you for what you do. You have the intuition and the knowledge to follow but you also have those who give a person a hand up instead of a push down. Congratulations. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to experience 
what these officers go through, I suggest you enlist in the Citizens Academy for the Police Department of Tampa. And either, even after the exhausting things you go to, you'll only be scratching the service, surface of what all these officers go through. Corporal, I thank you for taking that extra step. I thank you for being that strong, tall person that kneels down and talks to a child straight in the eyes. No officer has ever stood taller than when they kneel down to speak to a child. Thank you for everything you've done. Congratulations for your day. Thank you. Assuming we are at recess.
Carlson. Here. Vieira. Maniscalco. Here. Hurtek. Goods. Here. Miranda. Here. And Citro. Here. We have a physical form. At this time, we will be taking public comment. Mr. Shelby. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Um, just to remind Council, uh, as to your rules of procedure, I'm going to bring to your attention and the public's attention Rule 4D, which states Council members should refrain from engaging a speaker in dialogue during public comment. And those are your, um, your standing rules. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Do we also need to differentiate between the land use hearings and the, in case people are here for them? Oh, you mean in, in terms of an announcement? Yes. Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you, sir. Uh, with regard to public comment, those are items, preferably the people who speak first would be on agenda items, um, but you can speak to on agenda items or off agenda items unless your um, matter is set for a public hearing, whether the, the 930 public hearings, the 1030 public hearings, or the 130 public hearings, please do not talk about those items until they are called up separately. Thank you. Councilman Goods. Yes, sir. You have a request. Yes, a request was that uh, when we got the staff reports, uh, well, for item number four, uh, Representative Hart is here in reference to a memorandum that we all got in the issue on item number four. Then I, I apologize. I was misinformed. I, I thought your comment was for her to speak during public comment. No, when item okay. four comes up. Okay. Understood. Would that be after or before item four is discussed? I mean, we, we, I mean, I, I, it doesn't really matter. I mean, matter. It doesn't really matter. We will now take public comment. If you are going to be speaking during public comment. Diane, we're going to let you speak when item four comes up. Excuse me, Representative Hart. <laughs> Had to turn it on and turn it off sometimes. <laughs> if you are going to be making public comment, please form a line on my left, your right. Say good morning to all of you all, and my prayer that God would bless each and every one of us. I'm, I have, I suffer with an uh, old time, and uh, I don't get around like I was used to. But I thank God that for old time that I'm still here. You know, I come up here week after week, week after week. Nobody seemed to give a damn about me or my church. They blocked my church in. Well, I don't have nowhere to park. I had a lawyer over there yesterday. He said, where you parking before they built up all this? I said, we parking on the street. But now they done put that line out there, that devil orange line on the front street, so I can't even park in the front of my church and have nowhere else to park. The police come by there one day, told me he's gonna give me a ticket if I didn't move. I told him, go ahead, give me a ticket, cause I'm, I ain't, I'm not gonna move. He said, well, you could park over there. I said, no, I can't park over there. They don't want me to park over there. That's over there at the apartment building. I don't know why people seem to hate so bad and so heavy. It bothers me a whole lot. People don't want us to worship God. But that's the only one I am going to worship. It's God Almighty, because he's the reason I'm here this morning. And I thank him for it, too. But you know what? Tampa, Florida, again, would be one of the worst cities to work, 
stay and live in and try to do the right thing. We try to do the right thing. We're feeding the hungry, feeding the poor people, but they don't seem to want us to do that no more. They seem to taking all of our freedom away from us. But we got to understand, we still have the freedom in Jesus Christ, and that's what I'm all about. You give everybody else a plaque, but well, why don't you give me a plaque? Let me know you how much you appreciate me for what I'm doing. And I'm trying to do the things that's right. I'm not going to the schoolhouse killing up no little elementary school kid. I'm not going to, going to do nothing like that. I'm not going to shoot up nobody because I want to get the glory. I want to get to heaven. And that's what this life is all about, for us to get to heaven. I'm not striving to be here all way. My time is short, but I just thank God for the days that I'm here. And we must understand also, I, uh, Brother Goo, I got something I want to give you. Look like the devil following me everywhere I go. And uh, I got some property. I got some property in another, thank you. I heard it the first time. I got some property when my daddy left me here, and they done red tagged my property. And I want to know this here. Why is our taxes, homeowner taxes, going up so, so much? It's done double, triple, maybe triple. And uh, that's not right. Who do responsible for that? Is the city council responsible for anything? Thank you very much, sir. I will. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Drumgold, am I recognized, sir? Councilman Goods. Mr. Drumgold, could you do me a favor? Could you follow the pastor out, get his information, and see what we can do as it relates to that church? Because I know I've made several Please attempts do. about that church. I appreciate it. And whatever it he has much. to give me, get, get that for If you would do that for me, sir. Thank you, sir. Good morning, City Council. Rod Hatch, 1013 East Patterson Street. Um, I uh, came this morning in regarding two items on the agenda, but before I even get to that, um, I sent a, uh, a video to all of you about two weeks ago about a construction site. This is at 1001 and 1003 Robson Street. Um, it's just strewn with litter. Um, construction services, they're constantly going and inspect it. You know, I don't know why the city doesn't red tag this property and issue a stop work permit. This is just one construction site. There's thousands of these throughout the city, strewn with litter. I contacted the owner, um, nice young man, but he doesn't know how to manage his people. Um, the, uh, the storm sewer is supposed to be blocked. It's not blocked. The silt fencing has been knocked down for three weeks. What does construction services do if they can't address this? So then he finally gets a dumpster Monday, and this picture was taken this morning. So there's a dumpster there. On the opposite corner, you can see a garbage can here. There's the, uh, there's the blocking for the storm sewer still laying there. This is just this morning. We're, this is about 150 yards from the Hillsborough River. When it rains, it goes right in the storm sewer, it blocks the storm sewer, and it ends up right in the river in the bay. Um, you know, back in July, uh, you all discussed about fines for littering, and I know that's coming up again today. Since notifying you a week and a half ago, and the mayor's office, and I also filed a complaint with uh, Neighborhood Enhancement, I'd be curious to see how many fines were given to this property owner. I bet zero. This is the corner. This is just about every exit ramp and on-ramp in the city of Tampa. All this goes in the river. And what does the city do? We sit on our hands. We're complacent with it. Or we're going to spend $100,000 to our firm in Ocala to find out where the littering hotspots are. I can tell you where they are and I'll save you $100,000. Or we could take that $100,000 and apply it to an aggressive, compelling sign campaign. Keep it clean, Tampa. There's nothing compelling about it. People litter, I'll tell you why people litter. Because they're stupid, they're lazy, they're ignorant, or all the above. It's that for, it's that simple. Maybe we need a sign campaign that says that. Take the $100,000 and put it in a sign campaign and really make a difference. This is from Storm Sewers. I took a picture of this morning on Nebraska. This is last Saturday on the Hillsborough River. We have a beautiful river. We all talk about the Riverwalk, 
but the river is the heart of the city, and we do nothing about it. Right over here in this corner, that's what it looks like. On the hill, that's right at Hannah's World. Councilman Dudes, you talked about not enough trash cans. You saw how many trash cans I put there. Trash cans don't, fit, don't fix stupid, ignorant, and lazy. They don't do it. Lastly, I'm just going to leave you this image. This is Sunday morning at Davis Island at 7 a.m. or 7.30, right after sunrise. Garbage can right there. Signs right there at Davis Island. Not one of these signs talk about litter. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Man, says not Tampa, Florida. I want to say we need better leadership. We need leadership nationally, locally, internationally that addresses real issues and real situations and stop hoodwinking the people. Two 16-year-olds were one murdered, one shot in critical condition just within the last week. And you got the leadership running around here talking about gun buyback and all this other stupidity. Nobody put the blame where the blame belongs on the gun manufacturers. But anyway, what we need now in this city, we need a reparations tax on the ballot. Before we can get a reparations tax on the ballot, we need our city council representatives to start by taking the leadership role in educating the general public about the need for reparations. Thus, we need a reparation tax item on this city council agenda. African people need to understand the importance of reparations. African people need to understand that reparations will cure approximately 98% of all of our problems. We need not allow crazy white people with good white nationalist sense, people like Tommy Tuberville, to get out in front of the reparations issue. We need not to allow white America to put black entertainers and black athletes out front of the reparations agenda. I'm not saying that they shouldn't have an important voice or a seat at the table, but the white people would not care to know how Megan Thee Stallion, Nicki Minaj, Rihanna, NBA Youngboy, Shaquille O'Neal, Deion Sanders, and many other athletes, entertainment, entertainers, community leaders, or black preachers feel about the world economy, nuclear weapons, space exploration, or what can be done to prepare for the next hurricane. No one should expect that we as Africans should make employment sacrifices with free labor, land sacrifices with our continent of Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and other places and not get any form of compensation. Reparations will solve our problems in education, housing, child support, employment, crime, health care, every area imaginable. White Americans knows for a fact that they owe African people and African reparations. Instead of following through with the reparations promise, white America moved in the opposite direction by taking over 2 million acres of land from black farmers instead of doing the 40 acres on a mule. Instead of compensating Africans for our work, slavery, unemployment, and underemployment, white America slapped us in the face with lynchings, police brutality, housing discrimination, convict leasing, disproportionately incarcerating African people for victimless crimes, the death penalty, and an organized system designed to eternally keep the African man, African woman, and African child in everlasting subjugation. We, as adults, have to show leadership, not only to our families, not only to ourselves, not only to the homeless people out here, not only to the people that are experiencing housing crisis and employment crisis and other crisis, gas crisis, crisis, everything high. We need to show leadership in speaking truth to real issues, period. Uh, good morning, uh, city council members. My name is Walter Dunn. I'm a criminal justice advocate. Uh, my question for the council today is, with returning citizens coming back from, to our city from prisons all over the state of Florida, what job assistance and housing opportunities do we have to offer them? There are many grant opportunities available from the federal government to help with our great city. Why aren't we taking advantage of this? You have opportunity to further our outreach program while reducing recidivism at the same time. If there is no real you know, program or process that's available, um, I will be here to the end of uh, the session today. I have some great ideas and would love to discuss it with the council. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, if you want to meet outside, I don't want to take the council's time on it, but we're, we're actually working on something. If you want to meet outside, I'd love to talk with you. Sure. Thank you so Thank much. You, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Good morning, Mr. Chair, Councilman, Councilwoman. Allison Hewitt, 4904 32nd Street, East Tampa. And I'm here to speak on agenda item number five. We are in East Tampa, absolutely thrilled about the East Tampa Recreational Complex, and thank you so much for your investment in East Tampa. Um, but we want to also make sure you understand that uh, our community will be watching this closely as it moves forward. Um, we had a, uh, the agenda item is on the design build, and during their presentation for their uh, project, um, the community was thrilled when they said that they had a 71% commitment to minority small business uh, investment. Um, looking at this, this is the design build, and that is the 71%. And they said that the rest will be a goal once they have the construction design. And so we are encouraging them to um, stay as aggressive to their commitment when it gets down to the construction to make sure that small minority businesses are included. And we offer at the East Tampa CRA Economic Development Subcommittee if they would like to uh, work with us to the, do outreach for specific East Tampa businesses who would qualify, be bonded, and insured that we would work with them as they move forward. So we are um, pleased with the 71% for the design build, and we hope they are just as committed during the construction phase for their um, inclusion of minority businesses, and specifically inclusion of minority businesses located in East Tampa. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Councilman Goose. I see Ms. McGregor in the back. If you take notes to make sure that Mr. Baird and the, Ms. Wynn get that information and make sure they're partnering with the CAC over at East Tampa to make sure we, we, they monitor that closely. I, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to five, but make sure we pass that along to them. Thank you. Good morning, Keila McCaskill, Tampa, Tampa resident, native. And I'm here also on a, uh, item number five. While we're eager to have this, this project, as she mentioned, um, we're excited about the, the actual project, but as we move forward, I mean, we're super excited and, and, we're, and we're thankful for the commitment, the hard work and dedication um, to you, Councilman Goons, for all that you've encountered this past year, but yet still making this happen. In the uh, words of uh, one of my favorite seniors, Ms. Betty Bell, she said, you kept your word, and we thank you for that. So even as we move forward, we wanted to also, and the staff that participated, Nicole, doing, you know, in 30 days, she turned it around along with your assistance, so thank the administration for that. And so, like I said, we're excited, but we also want to put the vendor on notice that we're watching. We're paying attention to what's actually happening. We want the project, but we want quality. We want it at a fair price, and we want <coughs> lots of community engagement. And I'll get to that towards the end. We want the project, and like I said, we've seen, you know, our wounds here in the community are still fresh. We've seen a lot. You know, for our city council members that we trusted, we elected in this past year, we've watched them for doing their job, for supporting the interests of the, the constituents, for the people that have come to them over and over again. We lost one, this was one of my favorite, but we lost one, and then two of them were under attack. And after all of that, after all of that, for protecting our interests on a project where we raised questions, Hannah Street, we had questions for, for them trying to do what was best for the constituents. They came under attack, and then for other reasons as well. But they came under attack. Our wounds are still fresh. So we learned, we learned from that that we can't just take what we receive from the staff and administration at first, you know, just first at face value. We need to do our own due diligence. We need to do our own research. So in looking at the what was presented and seeing the information here, we're still, you know, we're looking at it. We hadn't, we hadn't seen anything in here that would contradict what we want, but we want to see more community engagement. So what we've learned, like I said, is that we need to see it. And I'm asking that the, the staff, you all take a look at it. I don't know if you've seen it, but because community engagement is so important, it only um, indicated that it would have two meetings during the design phase. I want to know what's the plan during the construction phase. I want more during the design phase, you're sitting in the middle of a community that's in a residential area pre predominantly, and most of the people that live there are seniors. What's your plan to address those seniors? I didn't see that in their presentation at the uh, Reagan Park, and I didn't see it here in this plan. So until you have enough information to make a decision for what's best from the community, until you confident about what they presented, I'm asking that you delay it and they come back with a more comprehensive plan that shows us what we're asking for and what they presented. I didn't see what they presented at Reagan Park in terms of numbers and how it matches to what they presented. Now I wanna see that as well as a more, I wanna see more 
for community engagement, particularly to those seniors that seem like they are voiceless. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Uh, my name is Victor DeMaio. Uh, my office is at 1205 North Franklin Street. I'm, I'm here on behalf of uh, several business owners and residents who live uh, in uh, the North Franklin Street uh, area, just north of here. Um, I met uh, after the uh, two incidents of murder and, uh, and some open gunfire here on North Franklin Street, a lot of people became more concerned, people that have uh, businesses and who live downtown about uh, what's going on with a couple of establishments down there, particularly Lit and Eden. Um, so we came up with a couple of proposals we'd like to see the City Council entertain. Um, one of the things if uh, we'd like to do is since there, this is localized to uh, one or two establishments, uh, if it's possible to uh, initiate the existing uh, nuisance abatement ordinance uh, and do some investigation on them, and rather than have all the bars suffer in town, maybe reduce their particular hours to uh, 12 or 1 o'clock at night uh, where most of the uh, incidents have occurred. Um, the other, issue, the other uh, suggestion would be to require those restaurants, or uh, not restaurants, but these are liquor-only establishments, uh, some of them, and uh, require them to have officers at the door. There is an existing ordinance on the books now that requires uh, certain establishments to have uh, officers at the door, but it's got to be over a certain amount of occupancy. Uh, so this is something that we'd like to see done just to these couple of particular instances because there's also been an incident where there's been open automatic gunfire in the parking lot across from a condo association, a condo across uh, on North Franklin Street and 717 lot as well. So we're only talking about the North Franklin Street, although a couple of days after that near my house on North Armenia, West Tampa, there was a killing in the McDonald's. Uh, so I don't know what's going on in Tampa at the moment, but there seems to be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, shooting uh, with guns. And I know you can't control everything, but uh, I met uh, with this particular suggestion, uh, I met with uh, Ken Paleo, who's president of the uh, Downtown Riverfront Neighborhood Association, uh, Abby Doring, who's uh, uh, president of the Down Tampa Downtown Partnership, Lou Preda, and myself. Uh, we, we, we came up with these suggestions uh, that we'd like for the council to uh, uh, to look at at least give give consideration at least have a discussion of what can be done uh, because it is hurting I also represent the Strath Center and the, the you know it's only a this incident happened just a couple blocks away and now that we're kicking up our shows again uh, there's people who lose par use uh, parking lots on uh, Tampa Street just just a couple blocks away between where this incident happened and the Strath Center so uh, we're very concerned a lot of people have a lot of investments in it I move my office from uh, around the airport to be downtown, close to be near my mom, uh, who's getting a little elderly, so uh, it's a little bit unnerving to have this happen. So we'd appreciate it if y'all can at least discuss this. Thank you. Councilman Goose. Mr. Chairman, uh, I see uh, May, uh, Assistant Chief Johnson back there. Uh, I've met with a, a bunch of residents uh, last Friday from the downtown area, and fortunately we had another shooting this morning. Uh, and I talked a little about some ideas that I'm going to bring forth to the chief. Uh, my office will be scheduling a meeting with your office, the chief. Uh, okay. There are some suggestions I have. Uh, one being that when I, when I do the circuit and you know I'm out there, mm -hmm. when I look at the bars, I look at training of the security. A lot of times they're hiring guys off the street with no training. I think maybe we need to come up with a program for these bars. If you're going to have a liquor establishment, possibly to have some training of their security staff of how to versus beating the hell out of somebody, throwing them out versus escorting them out the door, like what you're trained to do. Looking at, you know, I know we have an issue with, uh, we have an ordinance about police officers being at liquor establishments. That's not happening because some officers don't want to work the bars anymore. I don't know if we can get another mutual aid agreement, maybe some of the other small municipalities who might want to work and look at uh, an idea of having them as far as security. Looking at the ownerships, when I was a young officer working the bars, uh, at the end of the night, uh, the owners made sure, and though Saudi was a good owner, the employees went and cleaned the parking lots up. Uh, the trash, I, I get complaints about that all the time, all over the parking lot. I think that needs to be instilled. If you're releasing somebody's parking lot or those are your papers, you need to have your people go out there and clean. So I think it needs to be a training of some sort for the police department with all the bar owners 
of some do's and don'ts and some things that can be implemented. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to have my office set something up with you and the, and the chief to see if some things we might can do. Won't make a motion of uh, a motion today because I want to meet with you first before we come back to see what we can implement. And also zoning when you talk about Franklin Street. Franklin Street is now becoming more of a residential area. So maybe now we can look at the zoning there and change it and having bars move out of there. Some, some, some of them want the land now, so, so some we can, can get out right now because they're grandfathered. But uh, those are coming forth now. Maybe we need to change that. So I'll be looking forward to that conversation with you and the chief. And I appreciate that also. I know it's a main concern for the police department and, and the community. We have had those talks with Ebor City and some of their bars on how to provide that better security um, throughout the years. Franklin Street is something new. And it seems at times that the bars that open on Franklin Street, they don't have that security aspect. They like the business side of it. But they don't, not they don't like the security aspect of it, they don't focus on it. They don't know who's coming into their bars or their clubs. The one homicide that we did have, we had a couple of gang members inside there. They don't know who they have inside their clubs at times. Their security can be laxed. We are looking into it. I talked to Mr. Preda after the incident occurred and assured him that we're going to look into it. The training they need to really, um, try and be aware of who's coming into their club, where the patrons are parking at when they're going into their clubs are all going to be taken into consideration when we have those talks. Well, I like I, I would like you and the chief or whoever's of community affairs over there to go ahead and, and look at all the bars we have, mm -hmm. have a meeting with those bars, and maybe somehow put together some type of training programs for the bars. If they know what to do, they can maybe can prevent some of these things from happening, recognizing who's in the club. Uh, and, and again, you know, it may be something they need to pay for as far as we offer that. But I think when I go to the Ebor City, and some I see guys off the street, they just hire, hey, be security for the night. Mm -hmm. Oh, that ain't, that ain't from nothing. So I think it needs to be, maybe it has to be an ordinance or something and incorporate with that. But I'm looking for the ideas and suggestions uh, to come back with something. Sure will. So we'll, I'll wait for you, but I don't want to wait too long because I'll go ahead and make a motion and make it happen, but I want you to go ahead and look, start working on that and bring something to us. I'll be in touch with you. Thank you, sir. Councilman Mascaco. Thank you very much. Real quick, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up, and uh, and, and I appreciate the speaker. Um, I was going to make a motion at the end of the meeting, but I'm not. You, It's your district. You take the lead on it, but I'm happy to support you. I've met, too, with the community uh, there. Um, you know, a uh, man shot in the head in the middle of the street in Franklin Street, you know, and that's just one of other incidences. But if that doesn't send a message that we have a serious problem, I don't know what will. So thank you for taking the leadership on this, and uh, and I hope we, we find a solution. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just one more thing, if you don't mind. Councilman Goose. Thank you for being recognized. And again, I want the public to know we're not, I'm not advocating rushes because it's Franklin Street. Let me make that clear. I've been talking about this a while all over the city in reference to gun violence. Ebor and so forth. So now I think it just come to a head. So we, we look at the whole city as a whole, uh, Assistant Chief Johnson, uh, some type of program or training for everybody in this city so they'll know what to do and not do, not just because it's Franklin Street. So I want to make that clear to the public. Okay. Anything else? That's it. Thank you, Chief. Good morning, Connie Burton. Uh, October is special uh, for people that is um, engaged in fighting for liberation and freedom because we get a chance to recognize our beloved sister Fannie Lou Hamer and also look at the work of the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party was formed in 1966, put together a 10-point platform that um, spoke to the needs that African people needed here in America, and point number five was better housing. And so since 1966, uh, through the journey of the Civil Rights Movement, we are still talking about better housing. Housing for people of working means uh, to be able to uh, just find dignity in living. The other night, you, the city had, a, uh, I thought, a meeting regarding accessory dwelling, but to find out it was on virtual. The community don't want to be left out of those discussions. Uh, it was advertised on uh, Bay News 9, but unfortunately, you know, information came to us a little too late. So on point number, uh, agenda item number five might be like agenda number 26. 
The Hannah Street project is almost completed. You go down there one day, the walls are up, you go back, the garage is built. But when we go and ask people in our community, what is the economic impact coming to the community? The people that live there in terms of jobs, we don't see it. So hopefully when you're building your East Tampa development over there uh, in Jackson Heights, it don't be because we got a pretty design. Two or three people end up getting jobs and the rest of us are spectators. The item number 58, the $60,000 that the East Tampa group had to end up giving for the uh, strategic action plan, hopefully that action plan will become uh, of use to the community. Um, number 18, I'm curious to know how that's gonna benefit uh, people in our community. Uh, the benefit agreement, of course, we have been waiting to see what that's gonna look like as well. And I'm not gonna speak ill on item number four, but what I will say that in extending resources to any nonprofit, and especially if it's in East Tampa, we want it to be for the better good of the community, that we can actually see that people inside of our communities are seeing redevelopment and rehab. We have too many blue tarps on the house. We have too many people in our community just simply don't know how to go and obtain the information. And so when the city is doing all these wonderful things prior to election campaigns, we want to see actual work. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the chamber that wishes to give public comment? Do we have anyone online? Ms. Jean Strohlmeyer, if you can hear me, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Hello. 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 Ms. Strohlmeyer, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Holy mother. I don't know what's happening. Hello? <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, if I don't know if you could, I don't know if I can't hear y'all acknowledge. Anyway, hi, my name is Jean Strohmeyer. <clears throat> I was just on the phone and I didn't know it was already my time. How y'all doing? I hope everybody's good. Um, I just want to go through the agenda real quick. Transparency. Yes, we love transparency. Thanks, um, Councilman Carlson, for bringing that up often. And yes, I did not know about this $21 million, or whatever million dollar it was. It needs to be on the agenda every time, all the time, because we do stand for big numbers. Um, we need to know how much everything is. So, um, and then I just, somebody mentioned something about, you're talking about justice, social justice, criminal justice. Um, the Bible talks about justice, but it never says anything about anything in front of the word justice, because justice actually is getting what you deserve without favor. Social justice is getting what you don't deserve because you're favored, whether you're poor, whether you're um, rich, it doesn't matter. So just keep in mind what justice really is. There is no social justice. That is injustice right there. Um, on the agenda, let's see. Has, and let's see, I noted a few things. Uh, we're talking about all the litter and all that. And Tampa has a robust contract with Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful. We have Girl Scouts, we have Cub Scouts, we have groups all over that, it, that associate. And as a matter of fact, to do any kind of group project to clean up anything, we have to go through Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful or Keep Tampa, you know, whatever that Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful place. So <clears throat> just... It, and that's important. So we don't need to spend money on, on litter campaigns because that kind of thing is free. Just just add some more cleanup days. We clean up the river with by boat, by canoe, whatever. There's, there's a lot of those days. So just encourage more people and groups to clean up the litter. And yes, it is stupid people who do that and rude people. You go to Ireland, there's not one stick of litter anywhere on the ground. It's beautiful and green. So just so you know. Um, budget items. Um, number 25, y'all mentioned uh, it should include the details in Sire. I agree. Yes, let's do that. Um, anyway, I think there's a few other items that I... Um, citizen, oh, number 12, citizens' advisory budget. I don't really believe um, people that are appointed and not elected should have control over our budget. We vote to, for you people to 
be fiscally responsible. We don't vote for people on all these little advisory committees. I'm just a little worried about that. It's getting out of control, all these committees and such. Um, we don't need an administration under an administration. Um, and that's about it for today. Have a great day. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make public comment? Chief Bennett. Good morning again, Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. And again, good morning to the public. Um, as mentioned earlier during the agenda approval, um, the pleasure of Council to take staff reports in a certain sequence. Um, so it's, if it's okay with Council, I would use item number three to talk about items 24, 25, 26, and 27. Is that okay with Council? Any objection to that? Please proceed. Thank you. So I'm going to start with the um, with the odd numbers. So let me get those out to make sure that because when I wrote the memo to council, the final draft wasn't there yet. So item 25, which just for the public's sake, I want to make sure this is budget items on the agenda to include a one-page report in Sire with the following address of the project the number of bidders, the names of the bidders, the dollar amount, and then why the winning bid was selected over other bids. And first I want to say in the spirit of continuous improvement, <clears throat> transparency and visibility is, is what we're trying to do as a work in progress, working with our partners, both in council and the public. So every time we get feedback, and I'll give you a classic example that's happened in this administration, is that Councilman Dingfelder, who had a procurement background, brought up one time, if you will just put in the actual item, whether there was a cost increase, that's a barometric for a council member to go in deeper and look why there's a cost increase, whether it's 10%, 3%. And so our purchasing department adapted to that and put that right in the line. To Councilman Carlson's point this morning, is what do we make more visible as opposed to deeper inside the SIRE system that allows people to want to look deeper into the system. So again, in this journey of transparency, part of it is working on the visibility of the information. And so council's feedback, the public's feedback, helps us do that. Uh, I'll give another example. One thing that I was a proponent of and Mayor Castor supported right off the bat was moving towards the OpenGov platform for two parts. One, to enhance the budget awareness and the ability to go deep dive into the budget and I know there's a training curve and a transition curve to that, and that's still a work in progress. But also the performance metrics of the city, no matter what we're doing for customer service and community service, to bring those data points, whether they're enterprise driven or general fund driven, to bring that forward to the public and make that as transparent as possible, which allows further decision support, further analysis, and again, continued improvement for efficiency, equity, and um, effectiveness. So going back to this motion, um, which I appreciate asking for those things to be elevated, I called the TNI division that's responsible for kind of the back end of SIRE, and they instantly updated the framework of that staff report to include those items. They gave me a prototype that shows that they're right there on the front page, and it's my understanding that as soon as November 3rd, you will see staff reports that include those five elements. So if that's okay with council, and there may be another iteration that hits us over the next time we have together and we can make those continuous improvement efforts. So um, if staff has any, I'd like to go one by one to make sure there's no questions, but I do have a prototype. It may take a couple council iterations to get all those filled out, but the framework is there to fulfill what council has asked for. Any comments or any questions? Councilwoman Hurtak. I just want to say thank you for this. This is something that the public has been asking for for quite some time. It does help us, but really um, it helps uh, our, um, it helps the public, which is the whole point we're, or, and why we're here. So thank you so much for that. I appreciate it. Councilman Carlson. Yes, thank you for anything you can do to provide the transparency and the visibility. Um, uh, when we started three and a half years ago, there was great concern about the RFP process, and I know you personally have been working on that uh, to make it transparent. 
Um, there were a lot of allegations that were made back at that time. Uh, but that, that negativity has, has crossed, and because people are suspicious of the last administration, they're suspicious of this. And so the more information we can give that is easily accessible by the public, the easier it is to answer their questions and, and for people to have confidence that uh, they can trust the system. Thank you. Anyone else? Chief, is there any action that you'd like to take right now? No, if council is satisfied, and you'll see the prototype, and for some reason, um, you know, now, of course, because there's a framework, there's content, right? So let's look at the content together and make sure that it, the content meets the specs. And, and we have constant meetings, of course, at the staff level workshops, so we can uh, coach in the content as we go along. So Councilman thank you. Hertek, this is your motion. Are you satisfied with this report? Um, I am. Uh, actually, though, I'm going to ask that uh, this come back just to have it on our calendar in January, just to kind of, you know, see how, like you said, see how things are going, see if there's any updates or any changes that we want made. Um, uh, let's do that on January 5th during staff reports, please. Chief, does that give you and staff enough time? It does. Thank you. I have a motion made by <laughs> Councilwoman Hertak, seconded by Councilman Carlson. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Councilman Carlson. Um, also, Mr. Bennett, um, if you're going to explain the, the reason why a bid was um, awarded, um, I've had many circumstances where I've asked staff, why did, why did you choose this bidder over another? And the answer was something like, we like them better or because it's good for East Tampa or something like that. And it, it's very vague. And so I would just ask you, um, there must be some objective criteria that's used in deciding which firm, and it would be good to know what that was. Thank you. Thank you. Look for that content pointer. Thank you. Chief, did you want to move on to 27? I do, if that's council's pleasure. Um, 27, um, I wrote a separate memo on this just to break it out of the master memo that I submitted on October 12th. And the reason I did that is I just wanted to reiterate the work in progress again on continuous improvement of, you know, between the transparency and the visibility, there's also the timeliness. And I feel confident that uh, staff has done an amazing job of trying to get uh, either memos, staff reports, and the agenda items in prior to the weekend working with the clerk's office who does a tremendous job. So that gives counsel and the public typically the weekend to look through it, and then all the briefings that have been set up leading into the agenda item. However, there are certain unique things, of course, and if you noted in my memo, I talked about the challenges we've had over the last 30 months of having a busy city, a growing city, and being challenged by things like the pandemic, uh, of course, the storm we just had, et cetera. So every once in a while, there's gonna be something, and, and it really falls on my shoulders, and I wanna make that clear that if something's getting compressed against the deadline, that I try and make a business decision to move the city forward, and really the burden is kind of on me whether I try and get into the agenda. But one commitment I've made to staff and council is that we are gonna work hard to make sure all the backup material and everything is in place before the weekend of the week ahead of the council meeting, but if for some reason something has to go forward or be amended, then of course we will evaluate that as either a walk-on or some independent action. But um, so you can see the memo I put out almost 18 months ago, and then you can see the memo that I've updated from my office to both staff and council to try and make sure all the backup materials there in a timely manner to make sure the presentations are in place in a timely manner so we all have the best decision support going forward. So again, the housekeeping, the quality assurance, the quality controls are trying to get fortified and in place, but I appreciate everybody's patience with some of those agenda items under unique scenarios, and I tried to illustrate that in the memo. So any questions? Councilman Goose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe the HANA project I put in a motion, and I believe that's due to come back with a full report on HANA. I'm going to, that is, um, I'm going to talk about Hannah, if, if that's okay. It's the fourth thing I want to talk about on this list. Okay. So this is just the agenda at large that I wanted to make sure that council understood that we both look internally and, of course, for council's benefit to make sure that everything is in place prior to agenda week, if you will. Any feedback? Councilman Carlson. Thank you, sir. Um, 
Yeah, one, one thing is uh, we talked about a second ago in the other item is, is the, the summary, making sure all the words are in there and that any, any guidelines city council has set up it, are followed. Like, for example, we said if it involves pure, it can't be labeled as something else. It needs to clearly say pure. And, and I would recommend, I don't know if it's an official rule, but if it deals with a number, uh, the number should be in there. And there may be other things that you'd want to put in. Um, so there's that and making sure that it's there early. But then this one, this item is more about um, what's in the backup. Mm -hmm. And we talked about last week or the week before, there's a lot of backup that gets in it last time. And, and that was just after the hurricane, but it happens a lot. And I got to the point where um, instead of reading, we're, we're supposed to have everything in on Friday. And instead of being able to read the agenda over the weekend, I, I read it on Wednesday afternoon because so much changes, so much gets put in the last minute. And it's not fair to us, but in particular, it's not fair to the public. Um, uh, you know, we 88 items or 89 items today. The public has the right to see all that and understand the backup. And the summaries very often are not sufficient because you need the backup to be able to understand what the item is. And, and so um, in, in your review, I would appreciate if you had a hard stop date to say after this point, we're not going to put anything in. Um, and then on the, on the walk-on, I've seen, I don't want to go into examples, but I've seen kind of bad things done with walk-ins. Walk and um, I, I know I'm very suspicious of them and, and the um, walk-on, sorry. The, I'm very suspicious of them and the public especially is suspicious of them, especially when they deal with big numbers. You know, if it's, if it's after a hurricane and you need to sign a special contract to, for, for a vendor or something like that, that's one thing. But, um, but some of these things, when they come in at the last minute, it, it causes the public not to trust uh, the administration, but then if we support it, it look the, the public doesn't trust us. And so I would suggest that, that we not use walk-ons at all unless we absolutely have to, and we should explain what the urgency is and, and be as transparent as possible on it. Just some feedback real quick on that. So Good, Chief. Thank you. Um, we do have a hard date. We, we talk about memos getting to my office on the Tuesday the week before, the, the backup material settling like you've discussed, presentations being in the week before so you can compare and contrast the backup to the presentations and so of course the powerpoints but i will you know again i'm not an excuse maker that's not my nature but i think the volume and the scale that this city which means council the administration all the leadership in public support is doing things exponentially under unique conditions and and so those walk-ons again they fall on me when I get one, I evaluate the, um, the risk reward to the material and the timing. And so, um, you know, again, that was part of that memo is saying that we try and avoid walk-ons at, at all costs, but if there's a unique thing, and again, a housing thing may come up or something that's critical to the strategic plan to move the city forward, but I will use more judgment on that to make sure that it, it meets the standards of, of what you're asking. But really that falls all on my shoulders. Thank you. Um, just one follow-up. Um, there are also, also, you and I have talked about this before publicly and privately, but there also is the, is the kind of preemptive answering of questions that are obvious that the public will ask. And we have a lot of business owners in, in Tampa, thank goodness, which is what's driving our economy. And there are certain expectations that business owners would have. Um, you know, how, what's the rental equivalent to Hannah Street? Hannah Avenue, um, uh, you know, where are you going to put seven and a half million dollars? Um, and so, um, I, I, you call it the business case. Anything that we can do to anticipate the business case, because what happens is, like on the incinerator plant, I ask questions that I think, from a business perspective or a project, ma a, a government project management perspective, are are softball questions, and the answers aren't given. Um, uh, and then after the fact, people tell me, yeah, the answers are there. Um, uh, you know, I, if, uh, a year or two ago, I asked the water department, what's your, what's your operating uh, cost for, the, for your largest asset, the water treatment plant? And, and everybody around the table didn't know the answer. And afterwards, somebody told me, well, we knew, we just didn't want to say it. <laughs> Those are, that, that kind of information is, a, is something that is, would be reasonably expected to be asked. Um, you know, the 30-year cost of an incinerator plant, that's a reasonable question that somebody would ask. And so I think the more you can anticipate the business case, the reasonable questions that people ask, let's put those in there because it shows that we're being thorough and transparent 
and then it makes it easier for us to say yes. Thank you. Thank Council you. And I'm, so, I'm sorry. Ahead. I'm sorry, Chief. No, no, I, that's fine. I just want to make sure I'm responsive to everybody's questions and thoughts. Um, one thing that, that helps staff, and I try to allude that in the same memo, as a, you know, and, and I appreciate Council even today offering uh, a chance when a motion is made for staff, staff to come up and talk about capacity to get it done in a timely manner to avoid a continuance, and also make sure the content of the motion is actionable. And so part of the reason that you know, we have set up, and I started this before COVID sitting right in that conference room, and after COVID it evolved into a virtual opportunity. But the feedback from council representing those constituents, either in the special briefings on the bigger items or the weekly briefings before, helps us give that feedback loop to make sure that we did the last minute housekeeping. And if something we get on those briefings tells us that we need to pause because we don't have that answer, that's a great opportunity to do that. So, you know, I, I'd like to hope, and I, I believe it's true that staff is in all portfolios, highly responsive to these questions, whether they're seen early or seen midstream or seen late, but those briefings really are a big advantage to us to make sure that that we do very well when we come in on game day, like today, that the public is hearing everything as much as possible. So anything that council can do to support that journey is appreciated. So Council's thank you. Council won't hurt that. Um, I'm gonna echo it, what Councilman Carlson said. I mean, I generally like to sit down over the weekend and uh, read through not only the agenda, but all the documentation. And I keep notes for, for questions for my, um, for my weekly briefing um, or my standing meeting. And my standing meeting is Tuesday. Uh, but this week I had, uh, um, I often have notes for a certain number and just says no report, no report, no report. And if you say you're giving us a report, I wanna read the report ahead of time because I don't have time during the week. I'm dealing with constituents, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. It comes to me like I got, I requested during, um, during my meeting this week that RFQs be added because number five, the, comp the design build, uh, you know, we, we get all the information for our normal purchases, but so I got it <coughs> yesterday and it's this thick. And I, I, I mean, I did my very best to scan it, but I didn't have time to read it like I wanted to. And, and um, to, um, I mean, uh, Mr. Baird was wonderful and said that, you know, they've already talked about adding these in the future and that's great, but, um, uh, that's ex an example, and of course the littering, I've gotten um, four emails over the last, uh, like overnight, about the video that wasn't available. And so it, it's, it's that kind of stuff that we, we really do need them ahead of time. If it's not, if it's not in time for our meeting, we, m maybe it shouldn't be on the agenda. So yeah. I, it, it's a frustration, um, especially with things that I know are going to be hot button issues that the administration should know are hot button issues. So I know it's always uh, a constant improvement, but I would absolutely say that we need some sort of hard and fast rule that if we don't have the report, if we don't have the stuff um, by a certain date that we just can't hear it. Because it doesn't get, if it doesn't give us time, it certainly doesn't give the public time. So. Thank you for that feedback. Do you need any action taken today on this agenda item number 27? Councilman Carlson, this is your motion. Does it satisfy your motion? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Chief, we're talking about 24 now. Agenda item number 24. Correct, and, and I appreciate um, Councilman Carlson, um, you know, supporting the idea of bringing this back, and, I'll, and I think the presentation will help support that here in a second. But I also, um, to Councilman Good's point about Hannah, um, I kind of want to conjoin those together in what I'm going to share next because this is really uh, what staff has worked on and the mayor has encouraged that in this continuous improvement process to, to what Councilwoman Hurtak just talked about is making sure that everything is in the, in the space when we come forward to council. And so um, I want to talk about kind of how we entered the administration and all the good work that has been done, but now we're gonna build on that. So I'm gonna throw something on the overhead real quick. So in the spirit of capital improvement journeys, which is kinda 
those bigger ticket items that Councilwoman Hurtak just talked about, Hannah, which Councilman Goose just talked about, as well as Councilman Carlson. Um, there we go. So prior to the budget, you know, the mid-year happens out of the CFO's office, and then we start into that planning cycle, and that's March, April space. And there's a lot of planning discussions and workshops that's going on, and, and I think we've done well trying to increase the pace of those and the information sharing, whether they're one-off briefs or in, in the sunshine in this room. And we also, and again, that's on the agenda today, to improve our relationship and working model with the Citizens Budget Advisory Group. So that's another checkpoint leading into the two public hearings to adopt the budget. And then lastly, when the administration comes forward, just like they're going to come forward today on the East Tampa Rec Center, um, that's the isolated presentation for that specific agenda item, which now we're at the contract phase. And that's kind of in the historical run. And now what I want to do is talk about what we have discussed in the workshops. And again, with all the listening sessions, which is why I like to sit through public comment and hear from the community, um, this is something that we workshopped over the last several weeks, which is why I wanted to, to con consider a, a continuance on items 24 and 26, and I'll talk about that specifically. But going back to this graphic, on the left side, and we can pick any project, there's going to be a, a, a city owner of that project, and it really is tied to the address. So for example, the East Tampa Rec Center, Osea would be, Osea Wynn as the administrator would be the executive sponsor, Sharisha would be the owner of that project, the face of that project, because in the end, it's a park. But equally important is where the CFO fits in for the financing part and where legal fits in to make sure that we're within the boundaries of the code and the law and all the regulations. So the reason I call this the grade eight, that is the three in that pyramid. And then when you move to the right of this graphic, the, th the enhancements, because a lot of these have been more in a reactionary phase and we wanna bring these folks to the table when we make the business case when we go to the RFP, RFQ, and the contracting phase, and all the way through the project management phase. And so the support here, number one, is community engagement. Community engagement has to happen and be threaded through the entire thing. And Janelle McGregor's group has really given some great feedback on how to bolster the community engagement in all those three phases, making the business case, making sure that the contracting phase goes well, and equally important, make sure that the project management and the timing of the project is on point for the public's sake and, of course, for the financial aspects. The design build and, and what was just said in some public comment a few minutes ago is about the placemaking. And, and Administrator Duncan has talked about that. It's not just Fair Oaks. It's the mobility around Fair Oaks. It's the economic opportunity around Fair Oaks. And I had been at meetings with Nicole Travis when we're talking about these big projects and what it's going to do both in a positive and of course some analytical way in the community. So the idea of having not just the design build of the footprint, but what are we going to do to make place making around that. So all this needs to be threaded through all three of those phases. Next is something that I think you have seen and co-celebrated with us is the increase in the equal business opportunity aspects of the projects. There's been a lot of good front end work to feed the funnel of ready, willing, and able minority businesses, small local businesses, and get them more involved, not only as subs, but as primes. And so that's going to continue to grow. But the best way to do this is, again, to have all these folks at the table through all three phases of the project. Fourth is the apprenticeship. And we want to thank council for bringing that idea forward, making sure that we had code and accountability to make sure that all of our workforce development through apprenticeship, and you can see that threaded in a lot of these projects, not just delivering the project, but having ongoing workforce development embedded in those projects across the city. And then in discussions with, with Remmer's office, sustainability and resilience in every single thing we do. The only way that we're gonna make sure that we have a resilient Tampa going forward is project by project, phase by phase. So everybody you see is going to be around the table long before the business case is made. And there's a toolkit that we've, we've bought into that generates the ROI. And it does it all in a formulaic way 
to make sure that we know the ROI before we even come to council, that we can answer all of those deep questions that have been asked over the last couple of years, and ensure that these grade eight folks move through this entire system. So as the business case is made, as the business case is presented, as the contract is put out for bid, as the contract's been accepted and negotiated, and then of course through the entire project management phase. And we think that this will serve those four categories that I talk about constantly. The public and why this project's important to them, our personnel and how that impacts our personnel servicing the project, how it, it works with our partners, because a lot of partners are deeply involved in our capital improvement projects outside the city, and then of course the policymakers, which are the eight elected officials that serve the city. So I feel like this a comprehensive approach will do two things, which is where my ask comes in. As far as the HANA project goes, um, we appreciate council's uh, support on that through where we are now. We understand that there's some questions that need to be answered. And so my, my request of council is to um, have a two time a year capital improvement project workshop. And the reason I'm picking these two anchor points, one would be in October and one would be in April. And I'll tell you why. First of all, there's typically no workshops eligible in November and December because of Thanksgiving and then the holidays that are in late December. So October is typically the last opportunity for a workshop. And if we anchor October as the first checkpoint in capital improvement updates for council, and then April comes right after the mid-year, which is in March, and that does two things. It allows us to look backwards at the last six months and see all of the metrics associated and the quality control in these eight areas. And then it also is a springboard into planning for our capital improvement projects for the next fiscal year. And that gives a great feedback loop between the administration and council and the public to make sure that when we bring the next fiscal year forward that we're all singing off the same sheet music about these categories. And then, so the request today specifically is to ask that the HANA update be moved to next Thursday and encompassed with the other motion that's already existing for HANA's 17 point questions and some other things and, and give a chance for the administration to talk through this holistically. The second thing that I wanted to bring up regarding the 20 million and double public hearing is the idea that <clears throat> if we go through this next six months together and use October as the anchor point for updates and then come back in April, I'm not asking to, to change the motion or stop the motion, but we think that there's a lot of projects below 20 million that require this level of energy. And so the methodology to hit 20 million, while that's a, a kind of a rare number to hit in the city on a capital improvement project, we want to talk about things that may be 3 million, 5 million, 7 million. And so what our request for council would be is let's keep that motion in place till the, the April workshop. And if we don't satisfy the community engagement element and the public interface on all these areas that I've talked about, then we can revisit the motion. And so those are the two points I'd like to make on those two agenda items. Yeah, I, I appreciate the, <clears throat> the, the suggestion on the workshops. I think that's the, a, a good idea. But I think it's two different things. Um, uh, looking at the capital budget will give the public a, a longer chance to review. Uh, but, you know, on, um, I think it's because of state law, even on really small land use issues, we have to hear the mm -hmm. land use twice. And um, sometimes we get information in between, <clears throat> in between the, the discussions that's valuable to the second hearing. On, um, on Hannah Avenue, uh, we approved it, and then either the next week or the week after, in public comment, someone came before us and said that it didn't hit MBE guidelines, it didn't hit apprenticeship guidelines, and it did, wasn't put out for bid. And, um, and so that led to longer discussions. And had we had a second hearing, we would have had a chance to answer those questions. Instead, it devolved into uh, media and other kinds of scrutiny. And so um, I, I think I, I picked 20 million as an arbitrary number. Um, but I, I, you know, the first thing, April is after the election. And I think when we put things after the election, the public also asks us question, why are you putting things after the election? Uh, but the other thing is, um, uh, Th this is a simple process. What, what I would suggest is maybe, maybe you and I can talk, or, or you and your staff and I can talk, and you can talk to my colleagues, of course, but let's bring it back earlier and, and see if we can create I'm a process. Yeah, I, you know, I don't, 
apologize, but my apolitical side focuses on the, the budget sequence. I didn't even think about that. But if council wants it ahead of that, um, you know, it could be the workshop in February, it could be the workshop in January. It, for anybody who's paying attention, we put it past March, and, and some of us make it to a runoff in May, but if, um, if, if we put it past March, people are going to say, why are you doing that? Are you trying to avoid transparency? So w w when would you recommend, December or January? Well, I know that we, um, during the budget process, we requested a housing update in January, which is critically important. But I think uh, a good... You know, again, if council's willing to accommodate my request to have two anchor points and then adapting to the election cycle by moving it to January, I think we could show a, a great effort towards updating this information from the beginning in January. So I, January I requested 5th? to come back in January's workshop. Is oh, January workshop. Is there a January workshop. I don't see one. Wait a second. 26th, okay. So I'll move uh, to continue tr item 24. That's file number CM22-76982 to the workshop on January 26th. If I can, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, the January 26th workshop, is it specifically for then not only this item but the process? How would you want to frame the motion for the capital improvement plan? Um, I think your discussion, and I just want to show That's a this. separate, I'm just asking to move item number 24. Right, I, I think okay. my request, which I we'll appreciate it, the accommodation, keep is keep, keep the neighbor. motion intact and, and the, you know, our continuous improvement process, we're hoping, will engulf that in a different manner as we go forward. So as we give the capital improvement update, then council can decide whether they want to keep the 20 million threshold as a good, good jumping off point. Did I get a second or not? Yeah, yes, yes. I can. My, my point in raising this is the concept, and Mr. O'Hare, both Mr. O'Hare's here, but more Mr. Massey is also here. The concept of the capital improvement plan um, and a discussion about it also came up at the uh, Budget and Finance Advisory Committee. And the planning for the capital improvement plan also does take place during the year, and there are changes perhaps between one five year plan, depending on the economy and the situation and the following. And I think for Council's edification, with regard to having it in April, and Mr. O'Hara could comment on the timeline, I don't see Mr. Perry here, but that would be an excellent opportunity to talk about what's going to plan for the following fiscal year capital improvement plan and what changes because of whatever extenuating circumstances or the economy or construction costs, whatever, are going to forward changes within the capital improvement plan when the mayor presents it. Right. And I'm not suggesting to, to undo April. I'm just saying that we will also do one in January to meet the, the request of council to be ahead of the election cycle. So my motion yeah, is only f my motion is only for number 24. And then right. if we need to make a separate motion on that, I'm happy to do it too. Yep. Right. We already have a motion on the floor from Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. The Madam Clerk, do we want a, a roll call for that? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? And I have one more um, on number, ma'am. Yes, Councilor Carlson. Item number 26. Um, and and <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, I, does, does that satisfy your motion on item 24? Yeah, I don't know if, if, if Mr. Bennett needs a separate motion on his item. You can just put it on the, on the agenda, right? Well, so I, there's, I'm sorry, no, ahead, as please. we get to 26, my motion request would have been to move that to October 27th and match up those two motions at the workshop. So just a, just a comment, which is kind of tied to the whole discussion you just had, man. Um, you know, when I've repeated on Hannah Avenue and other projects, when I've repeated feedback I've heard from the public, um, I think uh, Councilman Miranda, also Councilman Cicero, has said, um, you know, why don't you get in, uh, outside law enforcement or a lawsuit or something like that? And I, uh, you know, I, ultimately we're here to protect in, in the city and the taxpayer money. Um, but but I've asked my attorneys, how do we how do we answer these questions about things like Hannah Avenue? I'm asked about Hannah Avenue almost every day. I hear from East Tampa that they don't want it, they don't see a benefit from it, and I hear from South Tampa that they uh, think that the process was not fair. The city attorney came out with a CCNA review 
that said it was fair and it, it was handled correctly. But we, uh, here, I'm just gonna give a suggestion, I'm not gonna make a motion, but we need to get out from underneath the, the cloud of this. And, um, and so there, there are several ways that we could do it. One that's been handled in the past is that the city attorney hires an outside attorney to review. But the public doesn't trust that because they see that it's, it's somebody that's too close to the city. Um, another way is to get a judge to review it. <clears throat> but to get a judge, we'd have to file a lawsuit and that would take a lot of time. But there's a third option that I would recommend. <clears throat> um, the, attorney, the attorney general gives opinions on issues like this. And uh, I cannot, as an individual, ask the attorney general for an opinion. Um, the city council can vote to ask the attorney general for an opinion, or the administration can ask the attorney general for an opinion. But just for uh, transparency and confidence of the public, um, if, if, the, if the views of the um, if the opinions of the city attorney are correct, then the attorney general will come back after a review and say, yes, we agree with the CCNA process. And then I can go back to all the people who have been criticizing it <clears throat> and say, say yes, uh, even the attorney general, who's separate in Tallahassee, even though she's from here, um, she reviewed it and she says it's fine. Um, if she says it's not fine, then we'll have to look at what those findings are. But it sounds like the city attorney is very confident in, that it is. But I, I would just, recommend that um, that the administration proactively look at that as an official review just so we can get out from underneath this cloud. Thank you. Understood. And my feedback on that is two parts. One is the graphic that I don't know if they can bring it back up on the overhead, but that is why it's been so important to get these grade eight around the table in all three phases. Let's, let's solidify the business case and the ROI. Let's talk about everything that is represented up there in a holistic manner as we go to contract and as we go to project management. And then the second part of my comment would be, let's address that, which I understand the, the point. I appreciate uh, moving this potentially to next Thursday's discussion so we can have a holistic workshop discussion about a major project. But I appreciate that feedback as well. Okay, getting back to item number 24. It, are you requesting that this council still make a motion to have two meetings a year, one in October and now one in February? Well, it, no, it's my understanding that 24, we just as it sits, that. has been continued to January. Thank you. Where we will give our first capital improvement update Thank to you. show that whether we need to modify the methodology, keep the methodology, or it's all baked in now to the process, which is my recommendation and hope, is that it'll satisfy capital improvement projects and another standard. So. Um, I think it stays as it is, and we'll just readdress that in January. But then to Mr. Shelby's point, we want to definitely settle on an October and April six-month semi-annual CIP update, one, to just make sure there. And I also appreciate some of the conversations during the briefings that say things come up during that six-month period from constituents, and if it's not acceptable to get it into the workshop, um, we can either have a meeting with that special interest group or whatever the case is, or if the motion uh, can be handled, um, you know, basically in isolation, then we can handle the motion. But I, if we get these CIP anchor points down, I think it'll really smooth out everything we've been discussing. So, Councilman Carlson, that satisfies your motion? Yeah, moving 24, the, the only question, though, is that um, you, you've asked for these two Yes. Uh, meeting. So a motion make... for a CIP update in January? Uh, so I'll, I'll move to add a separate, it's separate from 24, but just to add. Separate yeah, separate motion. Yeah, separate motion. Is the other vote motion voted on? That's where I was going. That's where I was going. Thank you. Did we vote on the other? No, no, that's where I was going. Please go ahead. Um, I, Mr. Bennett, can you help me with the motion? Sure. I'd like to make a motion to add two uh, capital improvement updates from the administration. Uh, twice a year, starting with January what, and then what? January 26th, and then um, whatever the workshop date is in April, if it exists already. The January 26th workshop, and then the workshop in April. We have a motion made by <laughs> April 27th. April 27th, thank you. We have a motion made by Councilman Carlson, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And then lastly, it's just, I think it's a formality, is to ask to take today's hand motion update and just move it to the workshop next Thursday. We have a motion made by Councilman Goode, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor? Next, next week. Yep, 
week from today. We settled it. Going back to the staff report matrix, um, the next bundle would really come from the CFO on items six, seven, and eight. I believe that Council Magood still wanted to talk about item, uh, agenda item number four uh, because he has requested a speaker speak to that also. Oh, yeah, that's fine. Councilman Carlson. Uh, Mr. Bennett. <clears throat> Mr. Bennett, one, one, more, one more question. Um, you did this matrix. Um, I, I, do it however you think is best, but it seems like it would be easier if you all just went ahead and, and, and changed the order of the agenda, if that's possible, so that, we, so that when we come in, we don't have to flip back and forth to a matrix, yeah. if you can set that up. Right. And I, I mean, we can design it whatever format we want, if you want to put the owner next to it or whatever. But um, I, I like the idea hard. of the chart, but if you could go ahead and just organize the agenda like that, it would be easier. We agree, and, and we're going to have that conversation. Uh, Mr. Shelby and I talked about it before the meeting. This was really a last-minute response after the agenda review yesterday. I stayed late, and I said, let me see if we can help with 26 staff reports. So. Councilman Hurtel. Um, I would also encourage for our benefit, but also the public, that if you're going to group them that way, if you could just put them under the heading of which department they might go under so that folks can just easily see, oh, um, because even me, I'm trying to, to learn what yeah. goes under what, and I think that would be helpful for the public as well. So All thank right. you. Yep. Our this, goal is to get the agenda aligned so we don't need the matrix. This, this was all discussed yesterday during the uh, chair's review. and. Chief said, let me try this out. So this is nothing set in stone. But the chief said, hey, I have this great concept. If we take a oh, cluster of them together, we might be able to save time. I think that's great. Yeah. On the record, I don't know if it was great. It was just an idea to try and help us get through the morning. All right, so item number four, I believe. Yes, so. we will talk about item number four. Which is still requested for a continuance, but to have a discussion. Right, but I believe Councilman Goode still wants to have a discussion. Councilwoman Hart, you are recognized under public comment. Good morning. I'm Diane Hart, uh, 2912 North 26th Street. This is my housing director, Ms. Vita Virgil. Let me give you your address. Oh, 1905 East 32nd Avenue. I want to thank you all for allowing me to speak on this item this morning. I think we need to bring some clarity because everybody sees the name East Tampa Business and Civic, they automatically believe that every dime that comes into East Tampa Business and Civic is to be spent in East Tampa. So I want to make sure that people understand we're running a citywide program, and I'm literally going to give you all the numbers so you can see the dollar amounts that have been spent inside of our CRA. But most people don't quite understand that city means the entire city, and those are the dollars that we've received. Not only have I gotten money from the city to do work in East Tampa, and throughout the city, I requested dollars from Ms. Cheryl Howell, who provided it from the county, something that had never been done, and those dollars were only spent in the CRA area. There's over 200,000 homes in, in East Tampa. So when people think that nothing's being done in East Tampa, today I wanted to bring you all the numbers so you could see exactly how many residents have been touched, how many people stepped away and changed their minds, how many people houses were over the limit and we could not touch those residences. So that's the reason that I ask. I hope you all got the spreadsheet showing you all of the houses and the dollars that have been spent inside of each one of our areas. So let me start with this. 39 were completed in the CRA from 18, from 2018 to current. 111 have been completed throughout the entire city. Those are rehabs. And that's using approximately $3.6 million. 1.5 million of those dollars were spent in just East Tampa. And I know when people look at it, they think it's not, but we have all the names, the addresses, so that you will be able to see what houses have been touched? We can provide you exactly how much money was spent on each one of the houses. 
Because I just think that it's important that people understand the magnitude of the number of houses that need money. There's not nearly enough money in our city, honestly, or enough is not being provided, let's say that, to repair all of the houses that need help over in the East Tampa only. So we have to consider, when we're using city money, I can't just spend all of the money in East Tampa. I'd love to, because I know the need. However, our organization has been chosen to spend these dollars throughout your entire city. And $3.6 million is nothing. When you consider we're putting $50,000 into each home to try and make that, bring that house up to code. And that's been a major problem. So if you look at the sheet, you will see that 19 homeowners cancel the applications. And, they, and some of those exceeded the limit. Those were outside of East Tampa. And then eight, 10 were inside of East Tampa. Eight canceled and decided they did not want to move forward. Two exceeded the $50,000 limit. So that was 39 plus these 10, which really would have given us 49 in East Tampa. But you all have to remember that sometimes when people realize there's a lien, and we have to have that lien. We used to didn't have it, and what was happening, as soon as we rehabbed the house, they would sell the home. So the city came up with the program and said, we must have a lien. So many people say, no, well, how can I leave it to my child if there's a lien on it? So they will walk away from our program rather than have that lien put on that house. So that's why sometimes they're walking away and leaving it. And we understand it. So now, the other thing I want to address is I keep being told that people are coming to my office and we're turning them away. Understand, East Tampa does not take applications. All applications are made through the city of Tampa. They go over to the housing department. That's where all applications come from. All East Tampa gets is a list of people who have been approved by the housing department that are eligible for repairs. We have no part in choosing any houses to be rehabbed. We never have. I mean, well, maybe in the 90s we did, but that's long been gone. So everything goes through the city. And I know many people think it's us that are turning them down. So you know, I came today because I need people to better understand how the program really works. We actually, when the city sends me the list from the housing department, we do a bid for that particular address. We have approximately, how many contractors work in the hmm. program? We have 10 contractors working in the program. We literally go out to the house, prepare a scope of what we believe, my staff and a contractor on our staff that works with us. They go to the house to try and determine how much work needs to be done. After we do that, we put together a scope of work. Once that scope is put together and we're ready to go back to that homeowner's home, we then take all 10 of those contractors. And at that time, we ask them, what have we missed? Because if we miss something, we want it added then. And that's what we do. We'll add whatever they say we've missed. Most of the time, we've not missed anything. Remember, electrical, plumbing, roofs, and AC units are the only thing that your city dollars can be used for. We cannot paint the outside. We cannot clean up the outside. We cannot do anything but those four major components. And sometimes people don't quite understand that either. Once the contractors bid, we don't necessarily take the lowest bid, but that's the bid we're looking for. But we know that if you're not within 15%, you're not gonna be able to complete that property. So we don't ask you to try to come in at the bare minimum. We know that everybody's got to make money off of the project, and we get that. So we're not trying to beat down our contractors. But what we do, and they will tell you, I'm very difficult on change orders. I believe you should bid fairly so that you don't keep coming back to me for a change order. I only approve change orders if you pull off a roof and all the wood is bad because we do allow for like $1,000 extra from the beginning on wood. Or you go into a wall, and it's worse than we anticipated, because we can't see inside of many of our older homes. Then I will allow you to have a change order. 
I have some contractors who've been a part of the program. And yes, are they complaining? Sure they are, and I, I don't blame them, but I'm not giving you cod blanc to just keep bringing me back change orders. You know as a contractor, based on your years of experience, on your experience period, approximately what it will take for you to do that job. And that's where I expect you to come in. So if you're less than that 15%, your bid is no good. If you're over the dollar amount, which is $50,000 per home, and everybody knows there's 50,000, your bid is tossed out. So does some people not like our bid process? Sure, but I have to bid because I want to ensure that whomever gets that has bidded fairly, and I don't expect them to keep coming back for change orders. What else? Um, that's it. So total rehabs in the CRA area, the total number since 2018 has been 55 out of my 111. So I, you know, I just kind of want the community to better understand we're working with what we have. And you cannot come to me and expecting me to put money into CRA if their applications were not in line. And we go first come, first serve based on the list that your city provides me. I do nothing to approve them or deny them. And I keep being told I'm denying my seniors. Not true. I also understand we had a complaint on a house over on Caracas. Understand, East Tampa Business and Civic did not touch the house. Me, with my want to be nice to everybody, went over to try and be a mediator on that property between a private homeowner and a contractor. So people thought we had a part in it. Nothing. We do no new construction for other people outside of our programs. So I just kind of wanted to bring it to you all so you could ask me questions and better understand how this is working. Good. I'll defer to Mr. Miranda first because i got a couple of questions I want to ask. I just want to say thank you for your explanation. Uh, it's very thorough and very uh, correct. Uh, and you're right in most instances when you say that sometimes the lowest bid is not the best bid. No. If you have three bids and the last two bids are within 4 or 5% and between first and second and third is 25%, <laughs> you got a problem because they may finish it, but it won't be with the same material. Right. And uh, so you, you have to look at all things. You have to be an eye in the sky. You've got to trust, but then you have to verify. That's right. And that's exactly what I heard from you. So when I see these things going on, and, and I see that you're spending the money, but when you go back and you say about the lien, talk to us more about the lien so the okay. public can understand that the lien could go away if certain things happen. Yes, yes. Uh, you, that part we didn't get to. Can you okay. explain that? Yes, sir, I will. The lien is based on a dollar amount depending upon the amount that we spend on the house. I think it's up to 10,000. How many years is it? And then no, no, it's 15, it's 14,999, then it's only five years. Anything over that is 10 years. That's what I wanted to say so the public <laughs> understand that the lien's not on put for 30 years. Right. Because that part, things change and people don't live uh, for 400 years. And what I would love to ask you all for would be some dollars so that when we have people with the trust problem on their homes, Everybody died, one person's left, it's still not in your name, to be able to do suit to quiet title. Those are things that we could help people with because many times we have to walk away. I did not tell you that we buy your insurance if you don't have any. And we can do that by verifying to the insurance company, I am putting that roof on. And they will accept our word for it. And then within a 30-day window, I have to show them proof that I've put that roof on it. Because many people don't have homeowner's insurance. And that used to be one of the killers for us. No insurance, we could not do it. But now we buy your first year for you. But you have to maintain it after that. And, and may, I, may I continue one more, Mr. Chairman? Yes, and, and thank you for the explanation on insurance. Today, not only the purchase of the house, but what do you have to do when you get the house? or you're living in the house. Certainly, insurance now is very high. Yes. And if you live closer to the water, you gotta buy another insurance. And fortunately, we don't have all in the area we're talking about today. But these are the things that homeowners have to understand. Insurance and repairs, even when you repair something, you don't know what's gonna happen in four or five years. You don't know what's gonna happen. And these things are, homeownership is very hard to attain, not only for the interest rate now, which is right at 7%, I think, 
for homeowners yeah. yes. and, and different things. So it's a, it's a very difficult thing, and I don't know how we're going to work it out, but it's going to be all of us together or the ship's going to sink. You're right. Councilman Good. Well, State Representative, that's why I, I tell you, I always want to hear from the horse. Because a lot of times people assume things and don't understand how the process works. I'm glad that you were able to come. I want to give you this time to explain on TV so we can review the film of what the process is because many people don't know what the process is. Right. And even to right now, some of the things I was thinking in our rehab is not there. I'm questioning why is it not there. If I'm going to do a rehab of a community, when I go and see a brand new house built on a, on a street and I got a ragged house, they go into a program, and if I'm, I'm going to fix a roof, why if I don't have some kind of painting in there? Because you're still making that community blighted. So I'm looking at CRA. If I got a CRA uh, rehab program, those things should be included in the row rehab, rehab program. Those, those, those dollars can be utilized however we want. Now, it may be some federal dollars we're using as far as the city program, which, I mean, that's a different program. But if I'm looking at a CRA dollars, I'm looking for a rehab program that's complete. I, I hear the dollar amount. Then we talk about the title situation. And I learned this out recently when I had a good friend of mine. Her father died. She could not get the light bill changed either because of the title of the house. Right. That's why I talked about our department looking at uh, uh, probate and these issues because that's what's happening sometimes. People can't get loans or can't do things when the parents die or a relative to die. And we have to be able to have a program in this city or something to be able to gear to that. So I'm glad you talked about that process as well and people can understand that your program is not just for East Tampa. You just have a name title of East Tampa right. yes. and you circulate the whole city. Right. And again, you don't generate the list nope. apparently. We generate the list, right. which I did not know how that worked. They don't come to you for an application. Nope. We give the application. So I think now uh, the public can know how that works. To me, yes, seniors are a priority because a lot of them can't do anything. Maybe it needs to be another generated list or a specialist. I don't know how legally we can do that, but I hear that all the time that our seniors who can't work anymore, their house is just falling, crumbling down to the ground. So maybe we need to look even what I see already, even with the city program, how do we help out a certain category uh, of, of people who need help the fastest? Uh, because if you're elderly, you can't, you can't do it. And I don't want anybody getting taken because they could have found some sad side street got to do a route, Mr. Miranda, and take advantage <laughs> of them and think the whole thing collapses on them. Right. So I, I, I appreciate that. Let me say, uh, the one thing we run into with a lot of our seniors is that it was a husband and wife, the husband died or the wife died, and the house was only in their name. And at this point, there's no way to move forward with them. So that's what we run into more that's so That's the old-time traditional way of living back in those right. days. Right, and there's no way to... Yeah help them with the house just in one person name you can't get it into the person that's living name because we have a lady on um she's right outside the cra it's on um robo street and she her house is deplorable so but we cannot we can help, her. help these people yeah so that's why i asked about probate these type of title issues because we have to help our aging population because back in those days same thing with my parents my dad's name has everything on. I'm just not really changing all of my mother's <laughs> name and my name on the stuff. Now I'm my brother's sister, so we, it, it, you have somebody who can keep it moving. But again, uh, I, I, I appreciate the answer. You, you gave a lot of insight to a lot of things that I didn't know myself about the program. You don't run it. It's run by the city. The city just gives you names. You say you got 10 uh, bidders. They go and they bid on the project. We move forward. So. I appreciate the chairman allowing us to get that time in so you can explain to the public because, again, you know, a lot of times you come under scrutiny, you know, and, and because you're elected officials, the people know you're wearing different hats. Right. And I want them to understand what the process is. So now they have questions, they can contact the city for certain questions and you for certain questions. Absolutely. I yield back to the chairman. Thank you. Councilman Carlson. Yeah, thank you to Representative Hart and her team for what you're doing in the community. Um, uh, Ms. Travis is not here, I think, but I, as I understand it, um, she had some questions from the public and she wanted to continue this so that, so that the questions of the public could get answered. And then whenever, I don't know the date we're going to continue to, but I, I would suggest that we make sure that uh, we ask uh, Representative Hart to come back and with, the, with the, the questions having been asked in private, they can be then answered in public so that we can have... Um, uh, make sure we have the public. Believe Abby, you see, Abby runs the program. You're, uh, you're recognized, Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Apologize, sir. 
Council, Abby Feely, um, Development and Growth Management. Um, I would ask that we just continue it to November 3rd, and I think that that would give us adequate time to make those connections and answer those questions that had come in from the public. So moved. Second. Diane, excuse yes, me, sir? <laughs> Representative <laughs> Hart, Representative Hart, I do apologize. I'm Diane Hart today. I'm strictly um, the CEO. You're asking for, for help with, with city dollars, correct? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. And you're at, are you asking for CRA dollars? Is it, I cannot is ask you for CRA dollars. It's a combination. I don't know how you all would and fund reason, something uh, like and that. And the reason why I'm asking this, and somebody can help me out there if you want to, CRA dollars have to be spent within That's the right. CRA, That's right. not outside That's of the right. CRA. And I think you were mentioning there were some houses outside the CRA that needed rehabbing. And so I just wanted to clarify for the people out there that are saying, can you okay. spend let me, let me clear that then. I'm sorry. Every dime that comes out of the CRA, I was one of the people who said on the forming of East Tampa CRA, must be spent in, in CRA, that yes. community. The other dollars get to be spent anywhere and, in the and city I of Tampa. I just wanted to make sure that right. people that, that are listening, that listen, that listen to our council meetings all the time and our CRA board meetings. Yeah, I'll have okay, to say, so right, we, we have it. Okay, we have a motion. Council, uh, Councilman uh, Maniscalco. Yes, I just want to say thank you, Representative, for that thorough explanation. You offered a lot of clarity, and we look forward to working with you so we can uh, bring much needed help to East Tampa and the city as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have still have a motion on the floor by Councilman Carlson. Did you make the motion? Uh, Councilman Vieira? I second it. Motion came motion. from there. Yeah, I just I need a motion. Motion made. move. move, move motion is made by Councilman Goode, seconded by Councilman Miranda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Can I ask you all for a something, though? Many years ago, uh, Councilman Miranda, you may remember this. When people had code liens against their homes, they were put on a separate list that got priority to get them off of that list so that fines would not continue to accrue and they would lose their properties. Well, as time has passed, we got rid of that. If you all would take a look at how we might go back to helping folk who are on that list of code enforcement, especially your seniors, because those are the people who get taken advantage of, sure. basically. She's absolutely correct, and I will get with legal and see what we can do when we get back with you. Thank you. We had a motion. And, 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 sorry, yeah. I don't know. Chairman, uh, do you recognize? Councilman Goods. I thought, uh, as a part of that, we talked, uh, it was included about liens as well. Uh, Abby, do we, I, I remember a motion about that, but if not, Mr. Randall, you go ahead and make oh, that. We'll make I, it after. We'll make it after, but I thought we had something, but okay. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Shelby. I, I, I don't recall that conversation, but I do know um, is that um, the way liens are now being handled um, by the administration is through executive order. So I don't know what council uh, has planned or with regard to that, but I do know that the process of how a lien, lien is resolved is, is covered, um, as I said, by executive Mr. order. Mr. Chairman? Councilman Goods. Okay, I stand corrected. Uh, there, were, there was a representative that contacted the city, and I believe the city has a contract with the gentleman in reference to dealing with the code liens. And I believe I've got a meeting scheduled with Ms. Uh, uh, with uh, Ms. Travis and the gentleman. I believe next week with the gentleman because I, I met him over at the conference. He said, "I don't understand, Councilman. I have a contract to help you deal with your liens. St. Petersburg has done implemented. I have the contract, but I I guess I have not been uh, allowed to go ahead and go forward. A staff is still discussing something. So uh, that was my conversation. That's why it came in my head uh, in reference to that gentleman in that company. I believe that's next week. I'm meeting with." Uh, Ms. Travis, in reference to that gentleman uh, in that company, says he has a contract with the city. I think Mr. Bennett is nodding his head now, so I think he kind of knows what I'm talking about. Mr. Chair. Councilman Carlson. Can they just make the motion now, or do we have to wait until new business? Well, we've been making motions. Do you have a motion you'd like to make, <laughs> Councilman Goods? I'll go ahead and wait. I have a meeting uh, 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 with the folks. I see Mr. Bennett was getting up the move because we do have a contract about this kind of situation. Mr. Bennett. <laughs> What? Yeah, I, I would defer to legal on the elements okay. of the contract, but I just want to support the philosophy is we've been talking about looking at the code as, as Representative Hart talked about. That's, that's where it needs to start because 
obviously that's the most vulnerable opportunity to to fix so you know the administration is in full support of using that list as the as the opportunity what I now, didn't as far want, as the I don't contract want to goes. taking houses but I told the gentleman out to the public that if we're in, involved in this program I want to be able to have a mechanism to right. where we help those people not just take their homes to where we can give back or remove because they're our liens <laughs> and then maybe get them with housing to be able do whatever, then put another lien as far as the, the, the uh, four or five years, whatever, to be able to help them stay in there and maybe then get a chance to rehab their home. Yep. What, what if you move it to the Fe Carlson, you recognize. Thank you, the February workshop. February we Let me hear from them, but I know they have a No, but if you just put a discussion about prioritization of, um, of uh, liens for individual homeowners, a, a discussion on that on the Fe February 23rd. What, I don't, uh, I don't appreciate workshop. that. That's fine. I would. Is Let's hear from him and he can go. No, this, this may be helpful or to the conversation regarding code enforcement liens. Yes, there we do have an executive order in place. Essentially, what the executive order provides for is that if a property owner brings their property into compliance and resolves the code issue, then the legal department can then compromise and and basically write off a huge amount of the lien liens that have because the liens. When a code enforcement lien is placed on a piece of property, it, the lien amount increases on a daily. Every day the, the code the code violation exists is a separate violation in, in essence. And so the code violation, so if you've got a mowing lien against your property and you don't get it corrected for some period of time, each day that that's in effect, there's another 50 or $100 that's added to that amount. So if you don't correct your code enforcement lien, for some period of time, then that can become a very large um, sum of dollars, a lien against your property. Well, Mr. Mash, I, I thought yeah. the contract with what, what, what explained to me in the meeting I had, and and when I was in uh, uh, Daytona, was that this company goes out and finds that property owner. My understanding goes and finds them because what happens is it sits and we can't find anybody, and that's what happens. So that was my understanding of what this company well, that, does. That, I believe who you've spoken to, and I, and I may be incorrect, but. We have an agreement with an outside law firm, but potentially work on collecting and foreclosing liens. Now we want to be careful how we do that because what how that what's happened in the past when we have hired outside counsel to be basically the collector or the enforcer of city code enforcement liens is that sometimes it becomes an, a burden on the homeowners. You know, there's some this we've had is instances in the past where a code enforcement lien has been in effect for several years. The amount of dollars that it, uh, for that lien now is like fifty or $100,000 or something like that. And so the, the attorney that is representing the city sometimes is incentivized to collect as much of that as they potentially can. The city is more concerned about getting the problem corrected and then making sure that the property remains in private hands. So there's so we've had this issue before, and so, so we want to be careful. We want to be careful how we how we do that. That's really. That's so I think a workshop might yeah. might be in yeah. order, so we can make sure that this council understands what we're doing because we don't want to just take people's property. We want to make sure that we're having them give them opportunity to get back in that property or be able to find the owners to get it transferred. Right. You know, they may not want it, and now we can do what we need to do with CRA dollars or so forth and so on. So no, it it, it can be a it can be a tool, but it has to be carefully used. That's that's that's. Mr. Massey, as, as being a, a, a former magistrate for code enforcement, I know of many, many cases where the uh, fines have been reinvestigated and or reduced or eliminated altogether by a person wanting to come in and buy a house or that was unaware that they were getting charged a fine. Correct. And, the, and, well, and what the executive order allows the city to do without coming back before the code enforcement magistrate is if the code it's issue is resolved, then it allows us to basically compromise and write off most of the lien amount. That's really, that, yes. that's what the purpose of the executive order is. And Mr. Chairman, if, if, if it's possible, especially if this is a, a new council relatively, if, if, if you could forward them and give sure. me a copy of that executive order so they're familiar with that process. Sure. Thank you. Uh, we'll make the motion, Mr. Carlson, you want to make it? We'll make the motion, reference to? All we need is someone to make the motion and second it. So whoever wants to do it. All right, make the motion for it to come back February 23rd to deal with the lien discussions, title discussions, and possibly the company that we're talking about with this contract. Second. We have a motion made by Councilor Magoo, seconded by Councilor Maniscalco. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I can't. 
I, I just want to apologize to the audience we have here today. As you see, these things may not mean a lot to a lot of people, but somewhere along the line, it means a awful lot to some people. And, and that's what we're trying to do and solve the problem. Liens are there, but that doesn't mean that uh, the lien is for a penalty. The lien is to get the roof done or whatever done. But the problem is, if you don't have the money to put up the roof and you get leaks, and you have a problem and you get code enforcement coming to incite you, what have we accomplished? You don't have the roof and now you got to leave. So we're trying to work it out so that everything becomes applicable and the party gets what they want and the city gets what they want to keep the neighborhood in a stable so we don't have to spend extra money. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. All right, Chief. Um, I know you want uh, Mr. O'Hara to come up with, I believe it is <laughs> six, seven, and eight together. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and Council. John Bennett, Chief of Staff. I do recommend Mr. O'Hara coming up and talking about with the understanding of what was discussed during agenda approval and how Mr. O'Hara will show how that relates potentially to item five. So okay. I suggest hearing them out and then we then can make let's, decisions. Then as let's we go. all hear all five, six, seven, and eight all together as they're all related, or do you just want to hear six, seven, and eight and then six, we'll go back? Six, seven, to and five. eight, and then five would thank be you recommended. Very much. Let's go ahead and we'll open the agenda item number six. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good, good morning, Council. Dennis Rojero, Chief Financial Officer. I'll begin with uh, six, seven, and eight, as we just discussed. These are three reimbursement resolutions for water, wastewater, stormwater, and various general fund capital improvement projects. We provided staff reports, of course, uh, but I'd like to give a brief introduction before uh, we bring up our bond counsel, Mr. Steve Miller, whom uh, I think everybody has met, uh, to go over why we think these are a good idea and uh, how we've had a great deal of success with these types of resolutions in the past. Uh, first, council approved these projects, of course, last month as part of the capital improvement program, and we're not asking council to approve any debt at this time. That will come later, as we've explained, you know, with the typical in-depth presentation by the applicable departments, my team, both internal and external, but we are asking council to consider debt service as part of the funding strategy for these items. A recent example of this, as some of us has discuss have discussed a couple of weeks ago, council approved the $55 million stormwater item predicated on one of these reimbursements particularly and generally predicated on the eventual issuance of debt service. We have briefed most of you. Thank you again for your time and interest. And uh, having said that, if I may, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Dennis. Um, for the record, Steve Miller with Neighbors Giblin and Nickerson, uh, the city's bond council. Um, I'm here to briefly explain these resolutions. I have spoken to some of you about it already uh, and to clarify some things. The first thing I wanted to point out is what Mr. O'Hare just uh, mentioned is that uh, passing these resolutions today does not give the city any ability or authority to go out and issue debt for any, any one of these particular projects. That would have to come from some subsequent action by the city council. Uh, what this allows the city to do um, is if the city, in undertaking these projects that are already a part of the CIP, spends some of its own money in anticipation of possibly doing a financing down the road, this gives the city ultimate flexibility in covering their bases to be able to replenish those funds or reimburse those funds that you spent for those projects. This is all required by the federal tax laws. Um, there's a rule out there that says that if you do want to reimburse yourself for any monies you've spent for a project from tax-exempt bond proceeds that are subsequently issued, you have to adopt one of these things. It shows your official intent there. So this is really just an insurance policy giving you guys, you know, ultimate flexibility in how you want to pay for these projects, financing some, paying as you go with some, financing all. But those are all decisions for the city council to make down the road. If administration subsequently decides that there's a project um, or two or three or whatever combination that they want to go out and finance with tax exempt bond proceeds, they will come back to you with another resolution, a lot of specifics, how much we're talking about, which projects, what's the funding source, the structure, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I just want to make it clear that adopting these today um, does not commit you to issuing any debt in the future. And I also want to point out the city's been great at doing this over the last several years. Um, they've been very proactive. They've, they've taken the initiative to do this so they don't get themselves in a bind or in trouble with any of the tax rules. I've got several clients that, that are not as proactive as the city. Uh, have one not too long ago that purchased a piece of land with their own money, $5 million. They always intended to do bonds, didn't talk to us or any other financing professionals. Six months later, they wanted to issue some bonds and they wanted to pay the $5 million back. And because they hadn't adopted one of these, they couldn't do it. Um, so again, it's our recommendation to do these whenever you're getting ready to undertake some large projects. And with that, I can answer any questions. Any questions or comments? No, no questions, just comment. Miranda. I appreciate uh, your conversation this morning with the city council and the all the citizens of the city of Tampa. Uh, so in essence, there's no burden, additional burden on the taxpayer. Correct, not at this point. I want to make sure, thank you very much. Councilman Carlson. Um, so let's say there's a, a $10 million project, uh, city reimburses itself from this fund, um, that when the money goes back in the other account, does it have to go back in the same account that it came from originally? Yes. And, and are there any restrictions to how that money can be spent? Do they still, does the city have to still have to come before us to get approval on the project and spend the $10 million that's been put back? Sure, let me answer that just with an example. You've got some project, this resolution requires you to, and it doesn't hold you to it, there can be reasonable deviations, but that you intend to pay for some of these projects, let's say out of the stormwater capital fund. Um, and you spend $10 million for stormwater projects in anticipation of doing the bond issue. And then down the road, you do a bond issue for the stormwater. You can put $10 million back into that stormwater capital fund. And then it can be used for whatever purposes that the stormwater capital fund can always be used but for. But the city, the, sorry, the administration would have to come back before city council to get approval. And more, I don't know if Morris wants to weigh in too. Morris, do you agree yes. with everything they're saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and you said yes, right? Yes. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Thank you. Because one her back. Um, his question is, do you have to, and you said they may put it back. Do you have to put it back in the stormwater? That is the idea. You're doing okay, a stormwater so, bond issue. So yes. You, and put so it's back not in a the stormwater may, capital. it's a must. Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Just wanted to double check. Yes. Any other comments or questions? Proceed. Thank you, sir. That's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Miller is too humble to state this, but he's one of the reasons we have been so success successful. He truly is with the proactivity, the disclosure, the detail. The, um, I do want to point out pardon me, that, again, uh, I have the privilege of representing the Revenue and Finance Department, but it does. It takes a full team, both internal and external, including Mr. Miller, our financial advisors, et cetera. If I can speak to, I saw Councilman uh, Carlson's uh, uh, request and perhaps recommendation for improvement in the process earlier on items number six and seven, and uh, I can speak to that in detail. But I'll start with, you know, uh, generally and obviously if Council feels the public hasn't been well informed for any action, Council can always continue it. Uh, but I, I would point out that this is really the second, third, maybe fourth phase of these project items, the first being presentation of the budget back in August by the mayor, where not only were these projects referenced, but the potential debt service issuance to fund these projects. That presentation remains on the website. And then again, at the first public hearing, we repeated it, uh, again, in the interests of transparency and all part of us uh, advertising, if you will, our intent, Council's intent to fund these projects. And then, of course, with approval of the Capital Improvement Program, the third phase, wherein each, uh, each project is individually referenced along with the potentiality of debt service being issued to fund it. This would be the fourth phase uh, right here, wherein we come forward for uh, the reasons that Mr. Miller has already explained. We think it's prudent. We do think it's transparent. And it, it's good planning. It's good planning on our part. It's good planning on, I think, the council's part to get the big picture of what we intend to do for projects that are funded from debt service. And then, of course, uh, as you heard Mr. Miller state, there's, a, there's another phase. If we decide to go forward with debt service, we will come to council again uh, with even more detailed information. Because by then, this is a very volatile environment, as everybody knows, but by then we'll know the rate structure. We'll know the rates, things like that. And then 
Subsequent to that, another opportunity for council and public scrutiny where we let the contracts. Again, where we, we will be compelled to reiterate the business case, you know, and the reasons we think these projects are a good idea previously. And then probably the final phase until project closeout, the periodic updates. An excellent example of that, I think, are uh, Ms. Jean Duncan's stormwater updates that she gives you. And uh, uh, fortunately, we've had a great deal of success and those, those, uh, updated, those updated project reports are always very positive. Uh, speaking to the inclusion of the dollar amount in the resolution title, that is typical for a reimbursement resolution uh, in localities because particularly we are not asking for debt service or any expenditure. However, I can certainly see how that might be a, an opportunity for continuous improvement if council and the administration feels that that is another mechanism to inform the public of what's going on. So from the revenue and finance chief financial officer perspective, that, that seems like a very reasonable addition as long as, and I'll defer to legal, as long as there's no legal prohibition against including the dollar amount. Any comments or questions? We have a motion okay. made by Councilman. No, and we, we can't include it. You know, I, the, the only thing that we probably want to make clear in the title is that because these reimbursement resolutions are not authorizing the issuance of debt, that we make it clear that that's the contemplated in the future action that, that potentially may happen and how, how the money will be paid. And so we just have to work on the, how the title is. Maker of the motion was to move item number six, not relative to changing the title. Is that correct? It doesn't. Okay, so as is to move item number six. Yes. Second. Okay. But to, at least moving forward prospectively, <coughs> that can be addressed. Yes. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, second by Councilman Miranda. Let's have a roll call, please. Pertet? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goots? Yes. Sierra? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Ms. Rojero, if you can give me one second. Uh, yes, without sir. objection, council members, it is 12 o'clock. We will be having a hard stop at 1230. Do we want to make a motion on that, Mr. Shelby? By unanimous consent, that's fine, sir. Thank you very much. Please continue, Mr. Rojero. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, again, I'm available. The bond council is here to answer any questions, and I, and I think uh, you also wanted to incorporate five, uh, seven, and eight into this discussion. If I can quickly summarize number five, again, it is a contract that we anticipate will be funded from debt service at some point. So it is has been, excuse me, included in this in this agenda item and exhibit a the list of potential projects. Thank you. Councilman Maniscalco. For item number five, would this be for the uh, the park spearheaded by Councilmember Goods? Uh, yes, sir. It's the East, this, I'm this sorry. The Fair, it's the Fair East Oaks. Tampa uh, Recreational Complex at Fair Oaks. Thank yes, Thank you sir. very much. Uh, move the resolution. Second. So, no. Councilwoman Hertak. Yeah, no, I, uh, before moving item number five, I definitely have a few things to say about it. Um, mm. I, the, the park is exciting. We're really excited about it. But my concern when I read this, and that's what I'm hearing from the public as well this morning, is that uh, you know we didn't get the RFQ. There was nothing. There was no information in Sire. Uh, we do not go to all of those meetings. Um, I've heard from the public that during the meeting to find the contractor, um, that public comment was not allowed. They were allowed to sit and listen but they weren't allowed to comment on it. And that's concerning to me because if that's the case, uh, you know, why do we invite the public? Um, even if they're just giving comments in the beginning, just saying, um, we heard from um, a, a resident this morning that they're, they're concerned that, there's, that contractually there's, there are only two public engagement portions. So I'm concerned about that because East Tampa has, they have been wanting this park for a really long time and they have very specific things they want to see in it. So I don't believe that two meetings is going to be enough. I'm concerned that if we approve this agreement, 
that we're not going to that there aren't opportunities for more than two. Uh, I'm also concerned because this is the initial design and build, and we don't have um, a max amount. How much money are we spending on this? Um, the community is concerned. I do understand um, from comment um, from my um, planning meeting for this for this meeting that uh, that that we will know about 90% into this particular process what the total cost will be, and that they've said that they'll stick within 40 million dollars. But how do we know that? Um, I know it still has to come back in front of us before that that's approved, but the community wants to know about that. They're also very concerned about MBE percentages, and while we have that with, with this particular part of the design portion, what about the build portion? So the, the community still has a lot of questions about this, as do I. Um, I don't know if any other council members do. But I, I have a few questions. Council Magoo, uh, you're recognized. I don't know where the at Fair Oaks has been coming from. I've never, I've never talked about that. I've always said East Tampa Regional Complex, so I don't know where the at Fair Oaks has come into play, but we can X that right now because you have seven different communities over there. And I don't want one portion taking, taking the sole control of an area. That area is not called Fair Oaks, only that building is called Fair Oaks. So you make that clear, only that building. That pond is not called Fair Oaks, and that penny saver ain't called Fair Oaks. So I don't know who came up with the idea that had at Fair Oaks, because I've had more community gators than anybody. What I don't want to see is a company come in and drag a community, a community engagement program out for a year, Councilman Hurt said. I don't have a problem in community engagement, but we've been talking about this for a long time in the perspective of what should be at that part, period. So to talk about dragging this out for community engagement for a year, I'm not for that at all. It shouldn't take us no, 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 no more than maybe a month or two months to get community engagement from those four or five associations in that community and get this project to move it. And that's what the people want to understand. When will it be built? Not three and four years down the road. How fast can we build it? Build it with a cost effective and efficiency. You know, there's no pool going inside that, pond, that, pro that project. We have a pool down the street. That's more money to putting a pool in that area right there because we got a pool down the street. You know, I've said from day one, we're talking about a, a, a great gymnastic center for our kids. I talked about also making sure you have the best senior center that we can have over there. We talked about the, better, uh, the upgrade of those athletic fields, that building, which should be demolished because, you know, we've already said, Mr. Carl's point, we talked about rats and rodents in that building being demolished. We're talking about possibly having some type of small type auditorium in there, uh, not huge, but suddenly where those kids can stay there performing that, that, in that particular community and not being transferred out. So uh, 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 we talked about, I don't know about a splash pad, but that, those, those little water things that go up, the kids can use as, uh, I can't think what it's called, but you don't need a huge splash pad. We talked about the ADA system uh, uh, for people, for accessible uh, kids, would be wheelchairs, things like that. Those are the men we're talking about. We're not talking about extravagant stuff. You know, we're talking about possible when you re do the rebuild. You know, that community has a lot of workers that work in New York City with the different communities. You're talking about maybe a small commercial spike kitchen that's in there so we can have training and, and things like that. That's what needs to be over there. So for me, uh, I don't know where the at Fair Oaks came, came in at, you know, because I ain't had nobody talking about that. Again, that community is not called Fair Oaks. That, that building is. And you have five to seven different uh, associations over there. You have Jackson Heights, you have uh, Rainbow Heights. I don't want anybody taking sole ownership to that. I want that in East Tampa facility. So I want to make that clear on the record. Councilman Goose. Oh, Mayor. Councilwoman Hurt. I just want to respond and say that no, I'm not saying that we need to have a bunch of meetings. I'm saying that communities has mentioned today that Yes, they want to be a part of the meetings, right. but really, more importantly, they just want to be kept updated. That's great. That's that's right. what I'm talking about. Two meetings about. is not enough. I, I no, no. I mean, not, two no. meetings is not enough. But in the grand scheme, you and I know that everyone's watching every nail that's going to go into that Absolutely. project. Absolutely. But they're just going to want updates. I'm I'm thinking of it akin to the um, Seminole Heights uh, or South. East Seminole Heights stormwater project where they can just have updates maybe on a website something like that so that's what I'm talking about in terms of but but we I mean I don't think two is enough however I mean we got this design criteria package and I really think that every member of council should have this um, I don't I, I asked for it but it wasn't I don't know I don't I think that, it, that 
I don't think it was given to anyone else. And it's, it's one of those things that we, we can't be everywhere. Um, we can't go to every single meeting. We can't know, we can't go to, I understand a fair amount of uh, um, work has been done in the community already about this, but we didn't get any background in this, this um, item number that, that I would have liked to have had. Um, and so I'm, I'm just saying that in the future, I would love to see these design criteria packages included so that we have this background information ahead of time. Mr. Chairman? Councilman Good. We talked about that seven number six county yesterday, and I, 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 I thought about that last night, but, and I want to make sure with, if the, the, the developer, design bill, scans is talking about seven number six, that it's 71% throughout this project, and even when you go to the construction site, making sure those numbers are there. Because what I don't want to hear that we're building a project, a major mega project project in the community, and yet those numbers dwindle. I want to make sure those numbers stay where they need to be. I understand the scans have got the, 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 got the contract. They edged everyone else out because there were two minority contractors that were, that were at the table. But my understanding is scans have edged them out because scans have said they could do the public engagement and they could have the project built much faster and could get the materials faster than some of the others who were bidding for the job. That was my understanding. So, I, so, I, so, so I, I'll, I'll sit back. I see Brad has gotten up. Miss Miss Wynn is there, and we'll, you know we'll undertake the comments. But I just want to make sure so you know where this councilman is coming from. From day one, I talked about what what needed to be, what should be, what has to be, and now we're kind of getting these little deviations in the middle. Uh, we we can't deviate from what the goal is. The goal is to have the best project we can have on East Tampa with the numbers. You know, we talked about a few names as far as maybe some buildings and things over there. You could still have a name up there, but then you have Mr. Gambrell, Mr. Miranda, who's probably the second longest employee of the city, uh, besides Mary Bryant, who's number one. You know, Mr. Gambrell worked though, at, at Parks and Rec for almost 48 years, 47 years. You know, and then Mr. Mr. Maniscalco talking about Mr. White, a lot of historical things. So I'm hoping that we talk about historical folks in that community also when we look at uh, some, some names on some benches or whatever. So I just want to make sure that we, we, we gather it all together with the engagement, but making sure we can move this project fast. Because what people don't all they see is we move and hand out a steamroll of speed and say how, how fast we're going to get this one built. Ms. Wynn? Ms. Wynn, yeah, you are with, recognized. With everybody permission, you know? Yes, Osea Wynn, Administrator of Neighborhood and Community Affairs. But council, I come before you this morning as the executive sponsor for the East Tampa Rec Center. And I have the owner of the project, Director Sharisha Hills. And we both, uh, we hear you loud and clear. We have heard you loud and clear. And we are committed to making sure that this project uh, occurs as expediently as possible. Councilman Hurtek, I heard your concerns about uh, members of the public not being able to have an opportunity to express their concerns or have public comment during the the um, the bidding during the, that that process. What you what council needs to know is that yes, the public was there, but no one from the public stayed for prior to the pub prior to the prior to the scoring where we offer that opportunity for public comment. So it was not as if they were not afforded the opportunity. They did not stay long enough to participate in the opportunity. So I want to make sure that that part is clear. Second part of it is, uh, Councilman Goose, we do hear you in terms of the, um, the length of time. The, the two month, let me get the two month time period in terms of public engagement, but get that straight. That was an example during the hearings, during the, um, comments of the hearings um, of the vendors that, oh, we can do this, it's possible to do it in two months. It's not a set in stone, this is what we're going to do. It was an example that they said during the process that if needed, we could do that. We, under, we did, we had some very spirited discussions to 2019, early on where we heard a lot of what the community wanted we took that feedback, we developed some draft plans. So the beauty of that is, is that we're not starting from a blank canvas. We kind of know what's needed already. However, we do understand 
that going forward, we still need to get some community input. We have, um, we have onboarded um, someone to assist in community engagement that meets our BBE numbers. So I just offer to you, give us an opportunity. We hear you, give us an opportunity to make this work and come back and present before you information, update you so that, and then as you're hearing things from the public, you have two point people that you can come to. I'm the executive sponsor. Sharisha is the owner. You have two people you can direct your questions and concerns <coughs> to, and we can get you the information that's needed so that you can uh, satisfy your constituents. Ms. Schultz, is there anything you want to add to this? I, I see you jumped up and you're standing there. Because we're a duo. She, she, got, she has I, I, my I, back. I, That's why she jumped up. You guys are the powerhouse. Uh, Shisha Hills, Director of Parks and Recreation. No, I don't have anything to add. I jumped up when she said the face, so I was just going to put the face with the name. So I'm the face slash owner. But, who um, doesn't know who you are? There's a lot of people that don't. I don't know who you are. You don't know? Okay. But we'll, you're on uh, my list. We'll settle it we, on the court. You'll, a, you'll we, know me after that. We have a motion yeah. made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Carlson. Any further and final discussions? Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hurtak. I just wanted to say thank you for that, and I'm noting that, and we will absolutely stay in touch on the thank project. You. So thank, thank you, you very much. Um, but uh, I, I do want you to have a quick conversation mm -hmm. with Ms. Hewitt as she leaves because she does not seem to think – that uh, she said she seemed to uh, indicate that there was no chance or she did not know about the chance to comment. So let's correct that for okay. future projects and programs. So Absolutely. I, I do appreciate it. Yeah, we're, we're all always learning and all always improving. So thank you very much. And uh, Chairman Citro, is there an opportunity for me just to introduce the two of our uh, BBEs that will be serving point on the project or not? Yes, ma'am, because you. you asked so nicely. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kim Jackson. I'm with KVJ INCPR. I'll be handling all of the community engagement and public relations. And we have How Harry Howard, who will be our architect as lead point on this project. Are there any questions? I've sit, heard quite a few things. Well, we've never had, I've done presentations. I did Julian B. Lane's community outreach. And we didn't have public people there. And one of the things that I did find during our project, we had people walking in and hey to people they didn't know. And it's very distracting when you're doing a presentation. And a large portion of the people, especially people who spoke, came after our presentation. And after we spoke about, they came towards the end of question and answer. So are there, I know there was some things about community engagement. Jim, any, any, any comments or questions? Jim? Councilman Goods. Yes. Well, good afternoon, uh, young lady. Uh, I'd like you to call my office so you can understand the major players over there. I don't know if you may know who they really are, mm -hmm. but I want to be able to give you the names of the major players because those major players call me all the time. Uh, so I want to make sure you know who they are so you can be engaged with those folks. So well, I appreciate that. Well, to engage for this presentation, we did a sampling where we interviewed the Jazzy Seniors. We interviewed, as our second group, the employees of the park. And then as our third group, we interviewed the young kids that were between 11 and 14. They actually used the park every day. So the city had a list of what they wanted, and we gathered a list of what they wanted. And then in our presentation, we had a circle where everybody agreed, and then we had separate parts where those things that they wanted. Now, the city says they didn't want to pull, but all those groups said they wanted to pull because the young people said they have a two-week um, swimming program that they're not able to finish because by the time they walk down to the pool, if it looks like it's going to rain or it's thunder and lightning, they have to walk back. So they've yet to create, be able to actually complete a two-week swimming program. So them, the seniors, and the park staff were saying something about having a pool they all agreed that there needed to be separate buildings. The seniors said they didn't want to be run over by children. And then the adults want to use the gym that are in the area, but they can't use it during the times when the children are, and that's because of legal issues. They all said they wanted a new building. They were tired of the bars on the window. The kids had really good things that they wanted, 
all of them and the seniors said they wanted a cooking area where they can take cooking classes and learn. Kids said they wanted a STEM room. They wanted a gaming room. They wanted to do Fair Oaks merchandise because they call it Fair Oaks Park. They wanted, to, they had very entrepreneur, they had more of an entrepreneurial spirit than when we were younger. So they had some really good ideas and then they had ideas that children would come out with. Like they wanted a racetrack around the park and they wanted glass over that, that pond because they wanted to be able to go out and see what, what was in the middle. But I did do that as a sampling so that we can show as a presentation that we do have an understanding of community engagement. And I'm taking some of the techniques I did with um, Julian B. Lane where we do street teams. I hire people within the neighborhood and we go knocking door to door so that they can get an understanding because we notice mail outs, people throw that in the garbage can. We'll be using CVent event software where we'll have 1,300 residents depending on the size of the um, public forum that we will be using say it was Middleton's Lunch 500, and then the other 800 can view virtually through the app. We did create a um, design already to start so that people can see well, this is what's gonna show when they look in the um, Apple or in the um, um, Google store, this design will pop up. That's gonna be a problem. Kid, kid, kid thank, thank, thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Mr. O'Hara, on items number seven and eight, how much more time do you need? I need no more time, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've made my presentation. Mr. Miller has made his statements. I'm available. We're available to answer questions. We have a motion to move item number seven. Okay, who made the motion for item number five? And, and Carlson. Uh, roll call vote on that, please. Miranda? Yes. Pertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Menescalco? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Move item number seven. Second. There's a motion made by Councilman Menescalco to move item, item number seven. Seconded by Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Yes. Vieira? Yes. Menescalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Pertek? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Move item number eight. Second. Okay. There's a motion to move agenda item number eight by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. Roll call vote. Goods? Yes. Fiera? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Hertek? Yes. Carlson? Yes. And Citro? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank, Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Council, there, there, we have a representative from Hillsborough County, uh, TPO slash MPO, that has been sitting here waiting patiently uh, for agenda item number 11. Do we have the time to hear her presentation? Uh, I, I would rather her state now, but if, if it's going to run long, we have to break at 1230 because we have to be back at 130. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, we can uh, hear Ms. Alden, who, I, who is a wonderful person, but we would have to limit comments, et cetera, and expedite it. I, mean, I think we can get it done in 10 minutes, frankly. Um, but. Um, and um, I, I, I need to leave here by 4.50 today. Um, <laughs> Me too. Yeah. So well, that's, yeah, that's the point I was trying to make earlier. That so there's time certain do. things that we can't do because we don't know how conversation runs. <laughs> All right. If we're leaving the room, can we leave room quietly, please? This all did. Thank you for being here today. Good morning, council members. I really appreciate your uh, bringing up this item this morning. Um, I am the director of the Transportation Planning Organization of which uh, the city of Tampa is a member. Um, the Transportation Planning Organization is responsible for setting priorities uh, that guide how federal dollars are spent in this area on transportation projects. Um, we are at a point where we are looking at our decennial uh, review of the voting membership of the Transportation Planning Organization. And um, Elizabeth Watkins, who is our principal planner, has a very short presentation for you uh, going over uh, how that review is conducted. And we're seeking your support uh, to move forward with a membership reapportionment plan. <coughs> Elizabeth Watkins, TPO staff. 
I'll make this quick. Beth uh, very clearly outlined what the MPO is, what the member, MPO membership apportionment plan is, and why you're here. Why we're here today is to seek your support on this plan. So a key part of the plan um, is required in state and federal statute to look at that decennial census data, which is updated every 10 years. What that population data showed was that Hillsborough County in the unincorporated areas has 69% of the population, while City of Tampa has 26, and the remainder is split between Plant City and Temple Terrace. Based on that information, on August 10th, the TPO board voted to change their voting membership to increase the voting membership for Hillsborough County for two additional seats. As you can see in this chart, with this change, that would make all seven BOCC members, also members of the MPO, and they would make about 40% of the, rep the representation on the MPO, although there's 69% of um, the population representation in the county. <laughs> the remainder membership would not change as proposed by the TPO, so the city of Tampa would continue to have three members, and all the other jurisdictions and transportation agencies would continue to have one seat. So we appreciate your consideration today of this, um, of this plan. We also will be going to the other local uh, jurisdictions to seek their support and then submit to the governor for their approval. So as Beth stated, we'd like to consider if you would take the consideration today to consider this plan. Oh, no, we have to decide our resolutions. Any comments resolutions? or questions? Let's go back, it, see, seeing none, I would like to go back and it's based on population. However, if that population stayed in one place 24-7, that would make sense. My concern is this, that the population of the city of Tampa doubles each and every day. We have more transportation, in my opinion, more transportation needs in the city of Tampa that, again, in my opinion, are not being met. But the majority of people from unincorporated Hillsborough County that were coming to the city to work. Now we also have people coming from Pinellas, Polk, Pasco, Manatee, Hernando, coming in and using the city of Tampa's roadways to work. We have people from all those other places coming in for our sporting events, coming in for our attractions. We have two major, major companies I'd like to say it's number one in the United States, but it's the number two airport where people from Polk, Pinellas, Pasco, Hernando, Sarasota come to fly in and out of. We have the 10th largest deep water port, which major traffic comes in to move goods either to the world or from the world. I feel that the city of Tampa needs more representation on the TPO. I have a resolution that would say one more person from the Board of County Commissioners and one more person from the City Council. Now I'm not asking for this council right now, but I'm also looking to the future of the needs of the citizens of Tampa and the transportation and the traffic and the roads that we have here in Tampa. Only 19% of the roads our city of Tampa roads. The others are state and county. We're asked to be custodians of those roads. <coughs> so what Ms. Aldis is asking today, that we adopt one of these resolutions, that we pass one of these resolutions, whether it be the resolution where two Board of County Commissioners are put on or I would prefer two more city council, but that's, that's not what I'm having my resolution, which is one board of county commission, one city council member. That's a discussion that we can have. I know the way I want to go. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I support that wholeheartedly. Dollar one second. Yours, the, the one and one. Any other comments or questions? Are you making a motion or are you going to wait? <laughs> you 
bit emotion than we've had together. I'm, 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 I am, I am waiting. I am waiting for any more comments or questions or discussion. I'm, I, go ahead. I, I, I think you made a presentation of a case uh, based on the historical factors of what, what the way it really is, and whether you like it or not like it, whether I want it, don't want it. Is it significant because the people do come into a metropolitan area, no matter what city it is, and they come in, they use the traffic, they use the lanes, they use the amenities of that, whatever city it is, and they go back home. And so maybe on those factors, there should be a consideration on what the chairman's speaking about. I'm just being neutral, but trying to explain exactly what's going on. And certainly that happens throughout every city in the United States of America of any substance. So those things, that are necessary, even on events, to sporting events, to opera events, to classical events, to music at the park, they come into wherever that event is. That doesn't say that we don't go out, because we do, but in the big metropolitan area, and uh, the county area, a lot of land, you, you don't find the spot of 400,000 people in one congregated area. And that's what he's trying to explain in a nice way. But I'm not a nice guy, so I gotta <laughs> tell you exactly how it is. <laughs> so what he's saying is that let's come together and let's come to some applicable agreement so that we can all have the pie and serve the public to the best of our abilities. I, it sounds like you want feedback before you vote, but I, I would uh, rely on your um, experience on the board to give this recommendation. If you make the motion, I'll support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? First, yes, sir. This is a resolution, uh, yes, sir. Well, that's, that's exactly, um, and I, I think that it, it it should be clarified that the resolution does not change the right. It's just a it's just a letter of. It's a, it's a resolution of city council. An opinion. Correct. Okay. But I mean, uh, maybe, Mr. Chairman, for the sake of clarity, you might want to just read the title of the resolution, and that might just make it clear. And and if <laughs> and, and if there is a response or or uh, a comment, um, either way, but you prepared to vote, that'll be fine. We don't have a number on it, but a resolution supporting an amendment to the Hillsborough MPO slash TPO 2022. Let me rephrase that. We are calling it the Transportation Planning Organization, but it is still listed legally as the MPO. Resolution supporting the amendment to the Hillsborough County <laughs> MPO 2022 membership appointment plan for Hillsborough County, its jurisdiction, school board, planning commission, and transportation operations by increasing voting membership to eight voting members. 18. 18, excuse me. Membership, 18 voting members through the addition of one Hillsborough County Commissioner and one City of Tampa member for submittal to Governor's Office providing an effective date. I believe Mr. Carlson second the motion. I see. Somebody did. I, 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 I believe Councilwoman Hurtag did. But I just want to clarify one thing. This will be sent to the MPO. Mm -hmm. This doesn't mean this is going into effect immediately. This is the City Council, all seven of us, recommendation to the MPO. And it may never get approved. Yeah, for all we know. But I just want our voice to be heard about our transportation and traffic issues that we, the city of Tampa, face each and every day. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Although I take offense at your earlier comment that Tampa International is the number two airport, I don't care what people mm -hmm. say, to it's me it's number, number one. Number one, yes it I is. I will entertain this motion. Uh, we have a motion from uh, Chairman Citro, second from Council Member Hurtak, correct? Do we need a roll call? Let's do a roll call. Miranda? Yes. Hurtak? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Goods? Vieira? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. And Citro? Can I say one thing? I didn't say And Citro? Yes. Motion carried unanimously with Goods being absent. Real, real fast, but before Joe Lepano in, to, in 2010, our airport had dropped below the top 10 list. We weren't even the top 10 list domestically. And so it's been a big turnaround last last 12 years. Kudos to him. Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, I have an uh, issue with the recess being only an hour. I had planned something for work for an hour and a half because we do an hour and a half. If no. I had known, if I had known that, I would not, I've, I would I've, not have approved 12:30. I would have said 12. Is that okay? 
Miss Alden, before you went away, I'd like to thank you for bringing this here. Uh, and council, thank you for hearing my, uh, my issues that we have. Uh, we have a time certain 1.30, so it's, it's, it's any time after time. It, Make it for two, two, motion for 2 o'clock. I can settle on 145, but Let's I Let's just I do need... 2 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. And if you have to leave at 430, you have to leave at 430. But